And so, so it'll be recorded as you heard, and we will post this on our website under um, webinars. So if you're not able to stay for the whole um, four hours, you can um, pick up the recording at um, probably be, be, be there about the end of next week. So with that being said, Amanda Bolin is going to um, be presenting first, and she is um, a registered nurse and a classroom teacher. She actually teaches in a virtual school setting right now, but she has been a, in a brick and mortar school. And um, it's quite special, her story, because her mother was all, also a health science teacher in the state of South Carolina. So I guess it's genetic and inherited that she would become one as well. So with that, Amanda, here's the microphone. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Y'all should be able to see my uh, screen here now. And I'm gonna open up my chat so too so I can try to follow along. Um, so I put a link in the chat and that is for the, um, the session today. So I'm gonna drop it in the chat one more time. And this is so that you can interact with us today. All right, so while everybody's getting in, you should see a memory test in the um, beginning and y'all can kind of play around with that um, until we get everybody in. And I'm trying to set up my screen so I can see y'all see the chat and <laughs> see everything. All right, so I'll let y'all have a few minutes to play around in that. Um, so while we're doing the um, presentation today, you're gonna see that it's through Nearpod and I'm gonna talk at the end about what Nearpod is and kind of how to begin that um, if, you want, if you're wanting to present that way. So um, just kind of showing you some things through Nearpod while we're doing the presentation today. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. Um, you should be able to still click that link even if I move forward and join. So um, here we go. All right, so today um, we're gonna talk about the standards. Um, we're gonna walk through those and uh, some do's and don'ts of teaching that I kind of learned maybe the hard way um, through uh, becoming a new teacher and, um, and then Nearpod. So like Nancy said, um, I, my name is Amanda Bolin. I've been a nurse for about 13 years, uh, mainly in emergency medicine. Um, and I've been teaching for about six years now. And so currently I teach at Cyber Academy of South Carolina. So it is an all virtual school. Um, and I'm also the Health Science Educator Association Secretary. All right, so I know we kind of already did this, but um, you should be able to see um, over on the left-hand side of your screen, a little pin and you can drag and drop it to where you are from. And y'all can probably tell by my accent, I'm from South Carolina. <laughs> All right, we got like some North Carolina, Georgia, lots all over the place here. Give me a few more minutes. All right, so again, here's our agenda. We're just gonna do the standards, do's and don'ts, and then how to use Nearpod. All right, so the first thing we're gonna look at are the National Health Science Standards. Um, NISHI has industry standards that we can follow to kind of guide us to teach. 
And so I wanted to just make you aware of that. Um, and you should be able to download that PDF file um, if you would like to. And so I'm gonna pull it up here and it should pull up in just a minute. And we'll take a look at it. Okay, so um, it goes by standards. The first standard is the academic foundation. So if you teach an anatomy and physiology class um, here in South Carolina, we it's like health science three, but I know that changes throughout the country. So um, this is where you would find most of your um, anatomy and physiology things. So you see here there's um, identification of levels of organization, the anatomical position and all of that good stuff. And then you can just scroll through. If you save this, then you can look at it later. Um, but it goes through kind of what we should, um, what the industry thinks we should be teaching these students. So um, muscular system, integumentary, it goes through all the different body systems there. So I'm gonna keep scrolling through. It goes through a few diseases and disorders um, that we should mention. And then of course, medical math, because everybody loves math. All right, and then we have standard two, which is communications. Um, and really this standard just goes over um, effective communication in a healthcare setting, um, in a professional world. It talks about different disabilities, such as aphasia and hearing loss and things like that, um, and some physiological barriers. Of course, medical terminology would fall under here. And then moving on, we have healthcare delivery systems, which are gonna include our insurance in healthcare, um, different types of practice settings, um, different organizations, all of that good stuff. Employability skills, what makes you a good employee? So all that. Legal ethical, which- um, legal and ethical debates and things like that. And then safety. So this is where our infection control would fall under, um, which you have so much to talk with right now with COVID. <laughs> so um, we could, you could really tie that into the standard here. And then teamwork. Health maintenance, which is going to be our healthy behaviors. Um, our Maslow's hierarchy of needs and things like that. Technical skills, so what um, skills we want our, our students to know, um, like blood pressure, temperature, um, all those vital signs, first aid, CPR, um, OSHA certification, all of those different um, certifications there. And then we have standard 11, which is gonna be our information technology. So. Um, our wearable, you know, medical devices like our Apple watches and things like that, um, diagnostic tests, um, charting. Um, so Tamara, um, what I usually do is I'll go through and I have a crosswalk here. So I'll show you, um, there's a crosswalk on Nishi's uh, website. And so I'll kind of show you that that's on our next thing here. So what I usually do is whatever I want to um, use as my material, I'll kind of go through and see what standards are uh, covered um, and then just kind of map it out that way. And so this is a crosswalk and it kind of has that ability for you to go in there and write in like what kind of lessons you want to add to, um, to the standards. Soon as it comes up. And you should be able to download this too, so you can look at it later because I know it's it's going over it pretty fast. But so here you can put, you know, your curriculum, um, how you would teach these things um, and courses. And normally the way I usually do, I usually do teach by standards. So I'll teach like healthcare systems first. Um, and we'll talk about the different hospitals and things like that. So I'll let you look through that. Um, and just for the sake of time, we'll go ahead and 
uh, move on to the next thing. All right, so here are some do's and don'ts um, that I just kind of gathered together um, and are some things that I kind of learned as I went. And so I wanted to share these. These are not like set in stone kind of things. These are just suggestions that I have for everybody. All right, so some do's. So be prepared, students can smell fear. Um, so the best way for you to have a good day is to be prepared. Um, students can know whenever you're not prepared. Um, creating a classroom management policy and stick to it. Um, so with that, um, you're gonna hear later on, one of our speakers is gonna talk about a classroom management um, more in depth. So I don't wanna get all into that, but once you have created one, just stick to it. Um, encourage students that it's okay to make mistakes because that's what you're there for. So we want these students to make mistakes while we're teaching and while we're you know, doing those formative assessments so we can correct them and move on to our summative stuff. Um, and also they, they don't need to be afraid to make mistakes in the classroom. All right, um, what to do in case of an emergency. So I started my very first year, um, I started in March and we had a bomb threat like the very next week. And I had no idea what to do for a bomb threat because I hadn't even thought about that. Um, so I would just suggest um, that you know what to do in case of an emergency and where to go and those kinds of things. Um, use different instructional styles when teaching. Um, and plan for students to get up and move. And so instructional styles can be, um, you know, we don't have to sit here and lecture the whole time to them. It could be student led. Um, it can be um, where they come up and present to the class. There's different instructional styles that we can use and they really like when you kind of um, change it up a little bit. So, um, and I believe that one of our speakers is gonna be talking on that, especially with like differentiated learning for, um, for accommodations and things like that. So you definitely need to, to listen to that um, presentation later on. And also getting them up and moving around because y'all know how hard it is to sit through, I mean, even an hour and a half sometimes if you can't get up and move around. So I suggest trying to um, get them to move around, make it a lesson. Um, so another do is get permission for travel two to three months in advance. Um, so usually when you do out of state and overnight travel, um, it has to be board approved. I know that can vary state to state, but I know in our state we do um, have to have board approval. So just making sure like if you're going on a host of conference or something like that, that you want to get those um, in two to three months in advance. Um, stand by your door and greet your students because they really like that. All right, um, participate and encourage students. Um, and that was supposed to say, I left some of that off. Participate and encourage students to participate in HOSA. Um, so if you don't know what HOSA is, um, it's Health Occupation Students of America. And we have one for every state. Um, there are state conferences that these students can go to and compete. Um, and then if they place, they can go to an international conference and compete with other students nationally um, or actually internationally. Um, so HOSA is really something um, that you need to try to make time for. I know it's hard as a new teacher to think of one more thing to do, but, um, but it will really help you. And there's lessons that you can do from HOSA and things like that. So I really encourage um, participation in HOSA. Um, keeping a contact log for parent contact. So anything you contact a parent for, it needs to be written down. Um, either if you email, then you have track of that. So that's good. Um, but if you're calling a parent or anything like that, you need to keep track of that so that, you know, if something comes about from it, that you can um, have that to show your administration. Um, laugh at yourself when you make mistakes because we're all human and we're going to make mistakes at some point and it's okay. And the kids will give you grace, um, I promise. It's, it's not the end of the world. Um, and then make learning fun. All right, so now we have some don'ts. Um, so don't use inappropriate language or bully a student. 
um, that kind of speaks for itself there. Um, don't be a drill sergeant. You want to have students respect you as much as you respect them. Um, and I say that because once you have gained, um, even though it's hard to deal with students, if you gain their respect, then you're going to get along um, a lot better. <laughs> so um, judge your, don't judge your students or play favorites. Um, one thing that I do too is whenever I'm grading stuff, and of course I grade online, so it's a little bit different, but I make their names go away so that I grade without knowing whose um, work it is. And so that way, there's no way I can, you know, judge um, one student over another or whatnot. Um, and then I suggest not to give a lot of homework. Um, you know, these students are in the classroom for eight hours a day. A lot of them have jobs at the end of the day. Um, and so giving a lot of homework is, I feel like is not um, always necessary. All right, um, don't leave your cell phone out for students to get a hold of because they will get a hold of it and take pictures and put all kinds of stuff on there. Um, be careful with your social media. So anything um, that you wouldn't want your administration, your students or your parents of your students to know or to see, um, then just don't put it on Facebook or, or Instagram or whatever, um, because it will, I promise you, they'll find you and then they'll use it against you. Um, allow any disrespect, don't allow any disrespect or bullying to occur in your classroom. Um, if it happens, just go ahead and squash it um, as, soon, um, as soon as it begins, and that way it doesn't become an issue. Um, and don't transport students in your personal vehicle. So this is really mainly for like HOSA or something like that after um, words or clinical students um, or things like that. It's just not really a good practice to transport students in your car. Um, of course, follow what your district policy or whatnot says, but um, I don't suggest it. So, um, don't talk bad about any coworkers, students, or admin with other coworkers or students because um, they will tell. <laughs> um, and don't give uh, full on bear hugs to students. So, um, you know, as new teachers, I know these kids need hugs. Um, a lot of them do. So, what I mean by full on bear hugs, you know, don't go up to them and do like this and give them the strongest hug you've ever given. You know, do elbows or give them a little side hug. Um, and that's just really to protect you. Um, so nothing gets said. All right, so I'm gonna give you all a chance um, to tell me or tell everybody um, if there are anything, I know you've been in, in the classroom and it's September, so tell me if there's anything um, that you have found that you learned, you know, since you started, um, or maybe something someone told you that you just think is great and everybody should know, go ahead and post that here. And I'm going to post the link for those of you um, that came in so that you can do it as well. All right, that was great. It's okay to admit when you do not know something, we're human too, yeah. So if you don't know something, you know, you can tell them, I don't know that, but I'll find the answer for you. I always check links to make sure they still work. Yeah, that's a great one. Building relationships with your students is very important. I completely agree with that. Review skills before you teach, collaborate with other instructors, um, ask for help from like minded people. Yes, keep students engaged. So um, I'm sure that this will be touched on, but if your students are engaged, then a lot of those classroom management issues will go away. <laughs> keep chocolate in your room for bad days. That's perfect. Being dependable is so important. Yes. Sometimes they just have a bad day and they'll come find you and talk to you because you've built that good relationship with them. 
Yes, good. Yeah, the principal doesn't know your curriculum. So um, remember, most of the time they're observing you just to uh, observe you and not critique you because they don't know what you're teaching about most of the time. Snacks are a great motivator. Yes, anything that involves food, definitely. Progress, not perfection. Yeah, perfect. Very good. Yeah, having a plan B. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to our next slide. Always plan your lessons. Yep, that's a very good one. All right, so um, this is a video. I wanted to play it because it it's very um, inspirational and you may have seen it before, um, but it also shows you how the video um, portion in Nearpod works. So I'm gonna play this. And y'all can sit back and watch it for just a minute. have spent my entire life either at the schoolhouse, on the way to the schoolhouse, <laughs> or talking about what happens in the schoolhouse. <laughs> Both my parents were educators. My maternal grandparents were educators. And for the past 40 years, I've done the same thing. And so needless to say, All right, so this is your first question. <laughs> And uh, so this works really, really well with if you're, um, like if you've ever used Edpuzzle, uh, then this is kind of similar to that. So um, I'll let y'all answer this and then we'll continue playing it. And so needless to say, over those years, I've had a chance to look at education reform from a lot of perspectives. Some of those reforms have been good. Some of them have been not so good. And we know why kids drop out. We know why kids don't learn. It's either poverty, low attendance, negative peer influences. We know why. But one of the things that we never discuss or we rarely discuss is the value and importance of human connection, relationships. James Comer says that no significant learning can occur without a significant relationship. George Washington Carver says all learning is understanding relationships. Everyone in this room has been affected by a teacher or an adult. For years, I have watched people teach, I have looked at the best and I've looked at some of the worst. A colleague said to me one time, they don't pay me to like the kids. They pay me to teach a lesson. The kids should learn it. I should teach it. They should learn it. Case closed. Well, I said to her, you know, kids don't learn from people they don't like. <laughs> She said, that's just a bunch of hooey. Frida? Oh, and she's said, awesome. We well, spent $318. Needless to say, it was. Some people think that you can either have it in you to build a relationship or you don't. I think Stephen Covey had the right idea. He said you ought to just throw in a few simple things, like seeking first to understand as opposed to being understood. Simple things like apologizing. You ever thought about that? Tell a kid you're sorry, they're in shock. <laughs> I taught a lesson once on ratios. I'm not real good with math, but I was working on it. 
and I got back and looked at that teacher edition, I taught the whole lesson wrong. <laughs> so I came back to class the next day and I said, look guys, I need to apologize. I taught the whole lesson wrong. I'm so sorry. I said, that's okay, Ms. Pearson. You were so excited. We just let you go. <laughs> I have had classes that were so low, so academically deficient that I cried. I wondered, how am I going to take this group in nine months from where they are to where they need to be? And it was difficult. It was, it was awfully hard. How do I raise the self-esteem of a child and his academic achievement at the same time? One year, I came up with a bright idea. I told all my students, you were chosen to be in my class. Because I am the best teacher and you are the best students, they put us all together so we could show everybody else how to do it. One of the students said, really? <laughs> I said, really? We have to show the other classes how to do it. So when we walk down the hall, people will notice us. So you can't make noise, you just have to strut. And I gave him a saying to say, I am somebody. I was somebody when I came. I'll be a better somebody when I leave. I am powerful and I am strong. I deserve the education that I get here. I have things to do, people to impress, and places to go. And they said, yeah! <laughs> you say it long enough, it starts to be a part of you. And so... I gave a quiz, 20 questions. Student missed 18. I put a plus two on this paper and a big smiley face. <laughs> he said, Miss Pearson, is this an F? I said, yes. <laughs> he said, then why'd you put a smiley face? I said, because you on the roll. <laughs> you got two right, you didn't miss them all. I said, and when we review this, won't you do better? He said, yes, ma'am, I can do better. You see, minus 18 sucks all the life out of you. Plus two said, I ain't all bad. <laughs> Four years, I watched my mother take the time at recess to review, go on home visits in the afternoon, buy combs and brushes and peanut butter and crackers to put in her desk drawer for kids that needed to eat and a washcloth and some soap for the kids who didn't smell so good. See, it's hard to teach kids who stink. <laughs> and kids can be cruel. And so she kept those things in her desk and years later, after she retired, I watched some of those same kids come through and say to her, you know, Miss Walker, you made a difference in my life. You made it work for me. You made me feel like I was somebody when I knew at the bottom I wasn't. And I want you to just see what I've become. And when my mama died two years ago at 92, there were so many former students at her funeral. It brought tears to my eyes, not because she was gone, but because she left a legacy of relationships that could never disappear. Can we stand to have more relationships? Absolutely. Will you like all your children? Of course not. <laughs> and you know your toughest kids are never absent. <laughs> never. You won't like them all, and, and, and the, the, the tough ones show up for a reason. It's the connection. It's the relationships. And while you won't like them all, the key is they can never, ever know it. So teachers become great actors and great actresses, and we come to work when we don't feel like it, and we listen to policy that doesn't make sense, and we teach anyway. <laughs> we teach anyway, because that's what we do. Teaching and learning should bring joy. How powerful would our world be if we had kids who, who were not afraid to take risks, who were not afraid to think, and who had a champion? Every child deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them, who... All right, so here is our next question before she ends her speech here. Every child deserves what, according to the speaker?
never give up on them, who understands the power of connection and insists that they become the best that they can possibly be. Is this job tough? You betcha. Oh, God, you betcha. But it is not impossible. We can do this. We're educators. We're born to make a difference. Thank you so much. So if you haven't heard of her, um, heard her speak before, she is an amazing speaker. Um, I see some of you asking how we answer on the, ch um, on the screen. So I'm gonna post this link um, and this, we're about to get into how to kind of do this. So, all right. So the um, website that you see here is the Nearpod website. Um, and it's given you, you might want to bookmark this because it just tells you um, like how to create a lesson and finding lessons and things like that. So um, what I'm going to do now is show you how um, to create a lesson through Nearpod, just a very brief, quick, um, you know, all of that. So what you're going to do, um, and I'm just going to open up another one so we don't lose um, our session that we're in right now. And move this over real quick so I can get to it. There we go. Y'all, and if I sound stuffy, I'm so sorry. I am getting over something that my children brought home from school or somewhere. All right, we're going to hope that this comes up here. Exit out some of my stuff up here. Maybe that'll help it go. All right, so. Let's try it again. So the lesson that um, I'm using is called Nearpod. Um, here's the code right here, and I'll put it in the chat again. Um, so the code, if you're doing it that way, is that WQ42K. And it's probably being slow because I'm already in a Nearpod, so. Here we go, okay. So what you're gonna do, this is what it looks like. Um, so there is a free version and there is a version that you can pay for. I did go ahead and pay for the pro version, um, but the free version, you can do all the same things. Um, so you're gonna come up here to create and create a lesson. And I've kind of showed you all a lot of the stuff that it can do. Um, so you can do the drag and drop. You can do um, the slides where you can draw on them. And I've got one that I'll show you. Um, you can do, um, there's simulations that you can do. You can do 3D. Uh, so I'll show you some of that. Um, but it's super easy. Um, if you have a presentation already created that you just want to add some like interactive things, um, so this is the presentation from today. Um, I'm just gonna drag it and upload it into Nearpod. And so it'll take a minute to put the slides in there, um, but one thing that you can do, you can add all these activities. So you saw there um, where 
you could change any of the slides into a draw it slide where they can draw on the um, actually on the slide itself. Um, you can do the drag and drop. You can do um, the videos, uh, web pages. So it really kind of keeps everything that I do um, during the presentation together. So I don't have to have you know all these different links up and all this kind of stuff. And um, I saw I think Karen put it in here. Um, it also helps them like not um, kind of go off um, and forget like they come, they really do enjoy um, being able to respond and things like that. So, um, so while that's trying to upload, um, you can add slides, you can um, add video, you can add web content. Again, there's 3D, um, you can do virtual field trips um, that they have. Some of them are already created in here. Um, and so you could do some of that. Um, and there's also lessons in Nearpod that are already created too that you could use um, from. Um, and then there's activities where, again, you can drag and drop. Um, you can do the open-ended question. So this is where you just ask a question and you just want some kind of response. Um, then they can put that in there. You saw in the beginning the memory test. Um, there's matching pairs, so you can um, have them actually um, have like a definition and a term and match them together. Um, you can do quizzes, you can add Flipgrid, um, and like I said, you can create a draw it on almost any of the slides. Um, we use one of the collaborative boards, so they can all put their input um, in one place. Um, so that kind of goes over everything. Um, while this is being super slow. So anyways, you drag and drop your presentation. It will upload here. I know mine's taken a while, um, but it will upload here. And then you can save and exit and add all the different activities here. And um, so the last activity that I kind of wanted to show you all is um, at the very end, a lot of times we like to do those exit tickets. Um, and see what all they have learned throughout the, um, you know, for, throughout the day for us teaching them. Um, and so this is a, if it's going to work, it's called Time to Climb. And so they can, um, it's like a little quiz at the very end. Here we go. It's trying. Um, and so we'll just do, we're going to do Himalaya. And we'll wait for everybody to connect and then we'll play. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and move on just for the sake of time. All right, so it's gonna count down and ask you some questions and you'll have to answer them. Um, and while this is going, so the best thing about this is that you can, that is, that's all right. I know.
So then you can see your leaders um, and all of that. Um, one of the best things about this is if you are having any kids that are out sick um, from COVID or whatnot, then you can actually do, you don't have to create a new lesson. You can do a student participation um, where they can do this on their own. So um, with that being said, that ends my little segment. Um, so I just want to say thank you for coming today. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and then here is the email for the Health Science Educators Association, and that's my personal email as well. So thank you, everybody. So I just want to say thanks so much to Amanda. You did a great job. I don't know if anyone can hear me because I'm at a stock show, <laughs> but um, uh, we really appreciate your time. And I think up next is Karen Edwards. Karen, are you ready to go? I am ready to go. So I'm um, ready to go. Yes, okay. Yes. And I do know that um, later today, hopefully Laura will send us good messages that her daughter won the goat show um <laughs> well let's not go crazy <laughs> well i mean i'm just saying i've got pictures of the cows that are going up in my room today so um, well, very good thanks karen yeah so i'm gonna go ahead and get started so we can stick to our schedule i know that about every 45 minutes we've got a new presenter for you and um, cynthia i do see your question in the chat, the difference between Kahoot and Nearpod. And um, I think Amanda may still be able to jump in the chat and answer that. I don't use Nearpod a whole lot. And my kids have started to ask not to play Kahoot. Um, they've got some other review games and things that they use, but Amanda is definitely the queen of Nearpod and can um, get that question answered for you in the chat. So what I'm going to do is I am going to share my screen and you're going to see my entire screen. So I apologize if um, all of the mini tabs are driving you crazy, but I wanted to share this video in the chat and to do that, um, I didn't want to share just the tab. So I'm going to copy this and put it into the chat for us because he is a speaker, author, um, teacher, all kinds of stuff. Um, Weston will be one that I reference. I want to go ahead and put that in there and I can drop it in again a little bit later on. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with the presentation. I'm going to close that chat out. Oops. It started in the middle. So we're going to, um, the kind of beginning part, obviously, you've heard that my name is Karen Edwards. I'm a teacher, educator, however you would like to say it. I am also the HOSA Future Healthcare Professionals Advisor for Spring Hill High School in Chapin, South Carolina. So um, Amanda, South Carolina, I'm South Carolina. Um, Oddly enough, Amanda and I used to work together when we both were first starting teaching um, many years ago. A little bit about myself so you know where my experience is coming from. I am in my ninth and a half year of teaching. I started uh, mid-school year when I started um, nine and a half years ago, nine years ago, something like that. Um, 13 years, roughly, athletic training. I kind of stopped counting after I renewed my certificate for a while. I was the 2020 South Carolina CT Teacher of the Year, um, president-elect for our group, and then the membership chair for the national group. So I'm really excited. I put a picture of um, one of the horses that I ride because I love spending time with the animals. I think they're very therapeutic. And then the two girls that drive me crazy enough to go ride the horses are there on the screen as well. So our objectives for today, um, we're going to talk about, and Amanda talked about this as well in, um, in her session, but relationships, 
bell to bell, and then routines and how that all plays into classroom management and um, just getting the most out of those young people in your room. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to talk about relationships. And I put three different hashtags um, on the screen and my admin, we're kind of big on social media production. So I'm just going to take a picture of that so they see it because it's knowing thy impact and then Weston's Breaking Bold and Bold School. The relationships, everything that you do in your classroom is built on relationships. And it, that goes from getting them to open up and learn to you, getting them to be on task, making sure that they're respectful to everyone. Everything you do has to start with the relationships. Um, I personally, I know Amanda mentioned this as well. Um, I'm gonna put the view back up so I can see just for a minute maybe. Um, I love being in the hallway in between classes. At first, I wasn't a teacher that liked it because I'm sitting there going, are you freaking kidding me? I've got to get set up for the next class because, you know, you're teaching two or three classes back to back. There's no time in between if you want me in the hallway. But what I found was, and I'll talk about this with routines, is if you build that time in so you can be in the hallway and greeting them, you get to not only see your students and their friends as they're walking down the hall, but you get to see like the other classes too. And that's big on promoting your elective class, um, at least at my school. And you're building those relationships with the school, not just the kids coming into yours. Um, the other thing that helps build the relationships is when you're using strategies that are used with intention. Now, Amanda also talked about, you know, you want to get up and move around for those learners that can't sit still. And um, we want to change up how we present the content. And that's your strategies. And um, when I first started, people would say that. And I'd be like, what the heck? You know, like, what is a strategy? I'm just going in there and teaching. You know, like, I, I just teach. That's what I do. So, um, yeah, like I'm seeing overwhelmed in the first year. I know, trust me. Um, oh, Rob is in here too. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to put that chat over to the side so I can see it. But strategies, all it means is you're teaching. What I kind of mean with used with intention as you have to make sure you're selecting the strategies that are going to work the best for that group of students. I have one group of health science students that are AP kids, that are high flyers. Um, their parents have high expectations of them. Um, you know, their other extended family have high expectations. And then I have a class that's not so high flying. Those strategies are different than my high flyers. So even though it's the same content, different strategies. And John Hattie, you'll hear about him throughout your teaching career. I think everybody references his books. And I do have a link to that that I'm going to drop in the chat at the end. But, you know, it's like creating those stories and those emotions. Well, I'm going to create my stories based on what the kids like. So if my kids are huge into soccer and I'm teaching first aid, well, I'm going to relate all I can back to soccer. And that goes back to relationships. Like what have I asked about the kids? What do I know about them outside of the classroom? You know, be passionate, but also be very genuine with your connections. If you don't seem genuine if you don't truly stop when you're talking to them and focus on them they're not gonna think you're being real they know how to spot a fake person a mile away nowadays and they'll call you out on it but if you're passionate about your content 
and you are genuine when you are making these connections and you truly want to help them get better, then they are going to be eating out of your hand. They will do whatever you ask them to. You could ask them to go up on the roof of the school and jump down and they're going to go, okay, where's the ladder? Like, how do we get up there? Because they trust you. Okay. Now I personally only have a few students that I would like to jump off the roof of the building, but that's okay. And you're not going to like all of them. You're not going to have that natural connection with all of them, but just asking how their day was, Hey, how was your class before this? Did you do anything fun? What are you learning in there? Hey, I saw you working at Chick-fil-A the other day. Do you like working at Chick-fil-A? Do all of that. The other thing is praising in public, but make sure you do the corrections in private. It is so hard, so hard to do the corrections in private because when I see a kid acting out on their cell phone, not doing what they're supposed to be doing, I want to verbal diarrhea out of my mouth and correct it right then and there. But what I've learned to do is I walk around when I do direct lecture. I don't direct lecture a lot. I do a lot of um, my classroom is flipped. So we're doing more activities, but I walk around and I'll just quietly lean down and say, hey, I really need you to put that phone away or hey, I'm just saying, this is what we're doing, you know? Um, but I also do that with praise. So the other students in the classroom don't know if I'm saying, hey, get back on topic, or if I'm saying, hey, I noticed that you have turned in four of your homework assignments on time in a row, and I'm super excited about that. So I do both ways, but I really do a lot of praise like out where the entire class can hear. If you take a student into the hallway um, to de-escalate a situation and you want to make that correction in the hallway, then three more times in the next week or so, take students out and praise them. That way students don't know when you are taking somebody out because you're super frustrated or you're taking them out because you want to say congratulations like you did really well on the last test. And I just didn't want everybody to know that. Um, so those are some of my big relationships in building those. Amanda said, don't give, you know, the front hugs, same side hugs, even now with um, all of the COVID restrictions going on. It's, you know, like fist bumps or elbows, but get those students to, you know, like just open up to you. Um, my next thing, oh, here's the um, Breaking Bold, again, is by Weston. Um, I cannot say his last name. I'm not even going to try. And then um, Weston and his wife, Molly, wrote the other book together. Um, John Hattie, I put his name up there just so you understand, like, I thought they were saying Hattie, like, with Ds, but it's not. So it's John Hattie and his effective sizes for different instructions. But just Google it and say, oh, look, stories and being relatable is really up there. But having them read this may not, you know, so you can kind of gauge that. And then knowing that impact. And that's another John Hattie thing. But it's also something that our district took on and our um, State Department of Education, knowing how you can impact your students being intentional with what you are selecting is huge. And if you have all of that, then you are going to be able to have good classroom management. Okay, so all of that goes back to classroom management. The second thing that I want to talk about is teaching bell to bell. And that sounds daunting. Like when I first started and they said you need to teach bell to bell. I'm pretty sure I looked at the teacher who was the room beside me and I was like, are they freaking kidding me? 90 minutes are my classes. They want me to teach for 90 
minutes. I'm like, these kids can't even pay attention to a TV show for 30 minutes without commercial breaks. So I'm going to break this down for you. It's not as scary as it seems. And it really does help because the less time you give them to get distracted, the less classroom management you have to do. Okay. Oh my gosh, Dana, three hours. I, I have a double block class that is three hours. And I'm going to tell you in just a minute how I handle that because after three hours, my brain is dead and their brain is not my brain. And if I can't handle it, neither can they. So um, intentional starters. Okay. Uh, I'm going to move this down just a little bit. It can't, so bell to bell, I promise you it can be done. When I say intentional starters, it doesn't have to be, um, I'm going to give you a quiz or I need you to come in and do this. It's just knowing that they're going to come in and they're doing something. And sometimes mine is a quick either Google form or something. And it's name your favorite Disney princess or like I have the family feud game. And I kind of, I kind of stole the trivia questions out of it. Don't tell my kids. They think that the game is lost. It's not lost. It's at my school. And I'll say, okay, family feud, you know, like what are the top five princesses that would have a really awesome biography? Write your answers down. Let's see who gets it right. You know, that kind of thing. Intentional starters just means that I know when they come in, they're doing this. They know when they come in, they're doing this. Um, the other thing is oh, chunking. This is what helps me, okay? And my brain breaks kind of go along with this, especially with my three-hour classes because I'm telling you, if I don't, if I just go, because I can lecture, like we all know the content. That's not a question. You guys, um, especially if you're a first-year teacher, you've come from the real world, okay? You've come from the industry. So you know the material. You know it. You could go on and on and on about it because you're passionate about it but you need to break it up. So I have my objectives for the day up on my board, just kind of like I have um, objectives and the points underneath it for you guys. And I give ourselves like, okay, we're going to do this for 30 minutes. And I set a timer because I get distracted and I will squirrel off somewhere else. And I'm like, okay, so we do this for 30 minutes. Okay. When that timer goes off and Right now it's set to like an old timey phone and it scares the living snot out of me. And then I look at my students and I'm like, whose phone is going off? And they're like, it's the timer. And I'm like, oh, that's right. So you have that chunk of time and you either direct lecture, which means you know, you've got a PowerPoint or you're up at your board and you're writing all the notes down and taking notes with them. Or um what you can do is, you know, like have an activity. And if you know that you want to spend 30 minutes practicing taking pulse, right? Well, still set the timer. Then at the end of that 30 minutes, if you need to adjust and go, hey, you know, you guys really, we need to go back over that. We need to spend some more time. Give them a break. Rearrange groups if you need to. Um, tell them to write down what they're struggling with the most within that skill or that topic. So break it up and then start your timer on the next activity or go straight into a lecture, do something. And you can even change like your strategy at this point. Um, well, uh, Melanie, we do not want you to miss your son's game either. So yes, these are being recorded. Um, so chunking it up. And when I chunk, especially in my three hour class, because I'm telling you, those three-hour kiddos, I had them last year as juniors, 90 minutes every single day. And then I get them three hours every other day now. So that's a lot of time. And we've built those relationships. And just like most families, there are days when we get on each other's nerves, okay? 
And so then I give them brain breaks. These brain breaks are just that. Your brain, if you are learning the cardiovascular system for the first time, and I'm throwing out, okay, we're going to start in the superior vena cava, and we're going to color it blue, and then we're going to go down into the right atria, and we're going to color it blue because it's deoxygenated, and then we're going to pass through the valve, and I'm giving them all of this information, their brain is going to hurt. Like, it is going to be physically hurting, and they are going to look like they have a migraine, and then their brain is hurting, and they can't focus, and then they forget the left side of the heart because you killed them on the right side. So give them a brain break. Okay. Um, A lot of times this is when I do some sort of like little review game that is content related. So I'll pull out, okay, like we've been doing this for 30 minutes or so. We're going to play Kahoot. My kids actually love Gim Kit. So we'll play like a round of Gim Kit that is content related, but then we do like a Disney one because I love Disney and they call me a Disney mom and that's fine. Like I have Disney puzzles all in my office right now. I've got Disney on my walls at school. We do something like that, or, you know, maybe we color, maybe we take a walk around the gym. Um, like where my classroom is, we just kind of like do a loop around the hallway. And I know that you can't always do that, but do something to, give their brain a rest, not just review the content, but literally give them a rest. Um, One thing that we have done for the classes right after lunch, and this is great, like if you've got those afternoon kiddos, take a class bathroom break, because let me tell you, those built-in bathroom break times, then you don't have them up and down, up and down, up and down. Hey, Edwards, can I go use the bathroom? Yep. Hey, Edwards, when she gets back, can I go? Yep. Nope. Say, hey, 30 minutes into class, we're going to take a bathroom break. Done. They get up, they move. It's great. Okay. Um, So really make sure you do that. And that also gives them a time, like if they want to check their phone, they can check their phone. Like if you want to do like a little three minute, hey, check your phone real quick and then come back. That's great because now that's not a problem in your class. They know they can touch their phone because you know it's like an extension. It's like a sixth finger for them. The other thing that I do that really brings to the classroom management is making sure I do a debriefing at the end. And this is like when I was talking earlier about being out in the hallway. So the last five, 10 minutes of class, I always do a debrief, okay? And it can change from day to day. It can look like, hey, tell me what was the thing you struggled with the most on this content? Or, hey, tell me what you absolutely know and you can go teach your next class um, kind of topic. It could be, hey, who do you think is going to win the football game tonight? You know, like we all know Clemson's going to lose against NC State. And if Nancy is still listening, this is recorded if she's not. Okay. Clemson's going to lose. That's fine. Maybe they'll win. I hope not. So, um, and I know that, you know, some other people are like, what the heck is going on? But Nancy Allen is a huge Clemson fan. So I have to like, talk about them losing because I do not like that team. I'm a Gamecock fan. So debrief. The kids that want to come up and talk to you in between class, and this is where I really struggled with my first couple of years teaching, is that you get stuck with those kids. They come up and they have questions. Hey, Edwards, um, I need to make up this. Or, hey, I need to do that. Hey, um, they want to tell me about their pet snake or pet gerbil, or um, they want to tell me about their pet rock that went missing, something, right? So what I do during the debriefing is I'm at my computer. If I need to pull a lecture up or pull anything. Yes, Laura, I did say that Clemson is going to lose. You can tell Nancy, that's fine. She'll get on this thing so quick. <laughs> Um, so the debriefing really just gives me the chance to get my computer reset if I need to reset it. And if I need to turn my projector off, I can turn my projector off. If I need to, you know, pull a cart that I've prepped in advance for the next classes, 
lab activities, I can do that. That's another thing that is great to do for classroom management is prep as much as you can in advance. That way your transition time is down. But during that debriefing, I've prepped what I can for the next class. I'm still listening. And now I'm ready to walk out at the bell with them. So my kids it may want to talk to me about their pet rock going missing or how, you know, like, oh my gosh, I just saw the latest episode of Chicago Med and oh my gosh, didn't you just love it? All of that, I'm walking to the door. And so it's drawing them out of my classroom as well. I go into the hallway. I stand on like the opposite side of my door because there's not a classroom across the hall for me. So that's where I stand. The students are drawn out. We're not blocking the door. Students can then go in for the next class. And that student that's in the hallway, I'm like, okay, remember, you got to get to your next class. Don't be late. And that's a good transition time. <laughs> yeah, I knew Nancy would get back in here to say that, but it's not going to happen. So the debriefing, it gives me multiple ways to get that high talking group of kiddos out and set for the next class. So when the next class comes in, we're ready to go, okay? So that's our second point. So we've talked about relationships, we've talked about bell to bell, and now we're gonna talk about routines. I am huge on these kiddos having the routines where they know everything that should be happening that day. And the routines are great for so many things. So in my class, bell ringers or what they do when they first come in the classroom. Um, I don't know if you guys call them anything else, but that's a time that I can take attendance, check in, are they okay? Like that should be one of, and it's one of the things that um, Weston and his wife Molly say in their books, uh, bold school and they are are they okay like are the students okay if they're not okay they can't learn you know I can do content checks with my bell ringers you know I can do fun games I can do anything but my students know when they come into my room there's something there for them to do it may not be a whole lot and it may not even be content related but they're doing something Okay. The other thing that's great to have a routine for, and it saves you a lot of time in explaining things, is the locations of things. Where can they find a place to put their late work? Do they have that routine of if my work is late, all work is turned in on Google Classroom? Like my, all of my students know your work is turned in on Google Classroom. If you have late assignments, turn it in there. If it's like an actual handwritten or like poster board project, there's an area in my room that is for late work. Put it there. You don't need to hand it to me personally. Don't put it on my desk. My desk, it will get lost. It will get eaten by things on my desk. There's a place for it. If you're absent, there's a place for you to find any information that you may need. We do a lot of interactive notebooks in my classroom. So if you need Anything to go in that notebook, if that's what we did the day before, you know where to find those uh, diagrams or the pictures or whatever else it is. They know where to find supplies. They know where the colored pencils are. They know where the scissors are. Take glue sticks, stapler, scissors, rulers, anything, note cards, anything that's like a, what I call normal classroom supply they know where to find it. And then there's the special areas. Okay, where are the gloves? Where are the, um, we do phlebotomy. So where can we go to practice those skills? We need to have Ms. Edwards with us in the labs. Where can we go for this? So one of the first couple of days of school, I always have up like a four corners thing. And that's how they learn where things are in my room. And it's great. It really does a lot in managing the times when somebody could distract me and now I've got 
four kids over here that are talking about where they're going to go party at on the weekend. Okay. The other thing is having a routine for academic assistance. Now, we would all love our kiddos to not need assistance. We would love for them to all be high flyers, get the material as soon as they need it, it's absorbed into their brain and they're good. But we all know that's not reality. Set up a time that works for you and you can dedicate it to academic assistance. If you don't, the kids will eat you alive at your lunch time. They will eat you alive before school, after school. I, I get to school an hour before my classes start. I'm supposed to be there at like eight. I actually get there at 730. There are kids that if they know that, they will be at my door at 730 going, hey, I'm just wanting to talk. I'm like, no. Miss Edwards is getting ready. Miss Edwards is trying to grade. So you really don't feel bad about setting the boundaries. Okay. Um, if kids want to eat lunch with you and that's what you want to do, that's great. Um, our good friend, Sarla, she will tell you don't eat lunch at your desk because your desk is where you work and you need to eat lunch somewhere else. Even if you have to sit at like a student desk or a student table, do that. I'm a big fan of that. I go sit at a student desk. I take my phone with me. I either put my phone on Hulu or I put it on Candy Crush or my Disney emoji game or whatever it is, except for on days when I have academic assistance or lunch duty. Okay. Any other time, if you want to eat in my room because you don't want to sit in the cafeteria for whatever reason, then that's fine. Um, yeah, Nancy, I don't eat lunch at my desk. I eat it at a student's desk. Now, I wipe it down first because students are grimy and germy. But I, I set that mental, like, I'm not doing that. Now, I eat chocolate at my desk. Okay, like on the bad days, I do eat chocolate at my desk. And I always have my water with me. Um, but really set the boundaries. Of if the kids want to come into your room because that's a safe place for them, that's fine. But you don't have to talk to them. I have kids that come in my room and they know that unless it's an academic assistance day, I am 100% focused on whatever I'm watching on Hulu because I didn't watch it the night before because I have kids. Or I am playing some game on my phone because my mama says she could get a higher score than me. That's it. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. So, Andrea, you definitely need to go somewhere where they can't see you if you want to hide. Um, I lock my door too. And every one of my department knows that if my door is locked, do not let a student in. Like that's just one, because with our content, it could be that like I've got needles out or I've got scalpels, you know, prepped for a lab or uh, some sort of safety issue going on. It's also because my department knows me well enough to know that if my door is locked, I am hiding from students. I am possibly also hiding from admin, but either way I'm hiding, don't come in. Like just, just don't. My principal knows not to come in if my door is locked, um, probably because a couple of years ago when I was breastfeeding, I was pumping and he almost walked in on that. So just like pretend you've got to do something and say that you're not there. Turn the lights off too. And like, seriously, hide. I mean, ser really hide. Uh, so those are my big things for classroom management. It really goes back to, Amanda showed that great video about building the relationships and um, making the connections with the kids and making them understand that they can do really well in your class. Oh, I got sidetracked earlier too. And I was thinking about this and adding it. I forgot to add it in. Another thing to build relationships and I don't have, oh, I think I do actually have, not a blank one, but I have little note cards that I send to my students. And I start the 
first week of school, I take my rosters and, you know, obviously they're printed out so I can take attendance. Um, I'm old school, even though a fairly new teacher still, I, I take attendance and do grades like manually. It helps me just um, focus a little bit better. And that's my personal preference. But however you do it, I have a roster every week, not every day, every week. I select like three students from each one of my classes and I write a note card to or a postcard. School mails it. That's great. You would be shocked by the number of students that one don't realize that people use real mail other than sending like hospital bills and stuff like that to um, two, you would be shocked by the impact that it has on your students. I am telling you, students love it. And students talk. They will, they may not say it to you, but not only like their parents see that they got something from the school. So the parents are a little nosy if it's a um, like an actual card and not a postcard. I use both. I purchase them um, with my stipend or whatever from the school that I get at the beginning of the year because I just don't like the school ones. I send funny ones like llama pictures or on the front of the card and then it's blank on the inside. Or um, I think the latest batch I got were like inspirational postcards kind of thing. And I write a message on there. If it's a postcard, the parent sees it too. I don't care. I'm not writing anything that's untrue or mean, you know. I'm not trying to bully the students. I'm trying to build that connection. And I'm, you know, it's something simple like, hey, I'm really glad you chose to take my class. CTE teachers are absolutely an elective class. We know for the most part, they choose to take our class, okay? Um, it may not have been their first choice. It may not have been their second choice but they choose to take our class. So just thank them for that. Hey, thanks for taking my class. I'm so happy you chose to take health science with me this year. You know, I noticed the first week of school already that you make sure you're coming to class prepared. And I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. I look forward to getting to know you this year. Bam, done, postcard, send it. But the impact something that took me three minutes, maybe, the impact is profound. I had a kid, first week of school, I was like, oh my gosh, this kid is going to be one of, and I say treasured students, that way they don't know that I'm talking horrible about them, you know, like if somebody else asks, I'm like, oh, they're one of my treasured friends. Um, Disney does that, I'm telling you, I'm a Disney mom. Disney calls their guests when they're being disruptive, <laughs> treasured. So one of my treasured students, the first week or so of school, I'm like, oh my gosh, he's going to be the reason why I eat so much chocolate this year. I wrote him a postcard and I was like, hey, you know, thanks for um, choosing to take my class. I'm really excited that you love to share in class, aka talk a lot in class. Um, Thank you so much. I look forward to getting to know you the rest of the year. Send it to him. You know, I, three days later, he comes in because it was from a weekend or something. He goes, Ms. Edwards, can I talk to you? And I was like, yeah, sure. You know, and so we're talking as, you know, we walk out the door after class and he was like, I just want to say thank you. And I was like, uh, for what? Like, what, what did I, you know? And he's like, thank you for writing the postcard. He was like, a lot of teachers don't take the time to even tell us that stuff, let alone write us a card. And you know, that means a lot. Um, we constantly are asking, how are the kids doing because of the pandemic? How are the teachers doing? How are admin doing? Are they okay? But we weren't always doing this stuff before the pandemic. So it's really important that this be a part of our new normal, okay? Um, routines really just help everybody, um, you know? And now that kid 
I'm telling you, he's not one of my treasured ones anymore. He is just one of my regular good students that participates. He stays on task. He's not on his phone. And he gets the kids around him to do the same thing. That is amazing that that one postcard that took me three minutes is now saving me a ton of classroom management time. And yes, Manuel, chocolate is not bad. Um, endangered chocolate or endangered species chocolate is my ultimate favorite right now. Like you've got, a matter of fact, it's so good. I'm going to put it in the chat because um, I ordered like $40 worth of this and I can't even spell. Um, I ordered so much of this the other day and it's so good. And they give back to like, um, oh, six minute warning. Uh, but Amanda, their chocolate is important. Um, okay, so I, I'm actually good. Um, so thank you guys for listening. And I, there's my email address if you would like it. And I'll put it in the chat as well. And if you have any questions, you can either put them in the chat um, or you can email me if you would like. I know that this is recorded and um, will be available to everybody. Does anybody have any questions as I stop sharing my screen? Oh, um, just so you know, like I use Slides Mania, Bold School and John Hattie are my absolute favorites. They really do. So any questions on anything? Yes, can you go back to that last slide? I wanna take a picture of it. Yeah, absolutely. Let me share my screen again real quick. Um, I'll share that one. So it's, um, he wrote Bold School and um, he also has Breaking Bold that um, he wrote with his wife and they're both really good. They talk about the relationships and how to um, manage those better and then how that translates to your classroom management. And um, I am very lucky that our former superintendent, she kind of started that. Uh, making sure we were concentrating on relationships. And my principal is key with that too. I'm very, very lucky with that. Um, yeah, so um, Slides Mania is amazing as well. I use um, Slides Mania for most everything in my class, even when I flip it. Um, the lecture that I re pre record is through Slides Mania. So thank you. And they've got all kinds of ones on there. I should um, get on there and think. Um, I think this is the website. Um, don't hold me to it. So if it takes you some, oh, I sent it to the wrong, wrong thing there. Um, I think this is it. If it's not and it takes you to somewhere weird, I do apologize in advance. Um, I really just Google it a lot of times and it's bookmarked now on one of the other computers. So do you guys have any other questions about me, about the horses, the cows, anything? Wow. This is better than my own class. Normally I get all kinds of questions about stuff. Karen, as usual. <laughs> Laura, I love it. So Laura's at um, a function right now, but look, okay, there we go. everybody can oh, see my daughter. So with sweet. <laughs> I love that. Oreo was so, trying to eat her that day. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. You did an excellent job. We thank love you. you. You keep us on our toes. Mwah, mwah. And did you see my thing in the chat? Did you really say Clemson was going to lose? Oh, 
That's some strong words. My Miss Nancy's gonna call you out. I know. I, well, she got in the chat and definitely said it. And I'm pretty sure she may be trying to drive down here to like, you know, um, choke me for saying it too, maybe. I don't know. Knuckle <laughs> sandwich. Well, yes, I'm definitely going to get it. But thank you guys. And thank you thank everyone you. for being here today. And Susie, are you ready to roll? Oh, she's starting screen sharing. So our next presenter is Susie McCatherine Lauer. And she's going to talk to us about um, ways to modify activities. So thank you so much for being here, Susie. Thank you. Now, if I can get this thing to move out of the way so I can start my slideshow. There we go. All right. So welcome to the um, third session of the Teacher Boot Camp, uh, sponsored by the Health Science Educators Association. Um, I'm a part of that association. I am the uh, professional development chair and very proud to be associated with these wonderful ladies that came before me. Unfortunately, I don't have the very precious South Carolina accent like Karen and Amanda and Nancy, so you'll have to just bear with me. Um, uh, my day job is at the Oklahoma Department of Career Tech, where I am a program specialist in the Health Careers Division, located in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Go Cowboys! Uh, I, I come from a long line of educators. Both of my parents were educators. I also taught in public schools and in higher education before I became a respiratory therapist. And let me tell you, this is sad to say, but I'm glad I'm not a respiratory therapist anymore. Um, I did that for 14 years in a hospital and a clinical setting. Um, also, I wanna say that uh, I just really appreciate everything that um, the National Health Science Consortium, also called NISHI, and our Health Science Educators Association is doing to present this information to you all today. Um, this, in, uh, this session will be a little bit interactive, um, so it won't be as cool as the Young Bucks presentation. I'm an old, old school girl, um, but uh, there will be some things for you to do as well. So um, lately, this has been my world. Uh, I, I've been home, uh, I had some back surgery and then I unfortunately got infection. So I've had to work from home and this is what I face every day. Although she's precious, it's a little difficult to get work done. That is Miss Gracie. So our plan for um, my little bit of time here is, first of all, I wanna get you inspired. Uh, we'll do a little activity and then we'll discuss ways to change activities. We'll look at assignments, our classroom environment, and some teaching strategies. I'm not real good at monitoring the chat. <laughs> Susie, I'll be able to help you if you have any questions. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> yeah, why don't you do that? I'm not as, as uh, good at uh, watching, reading, and responding like you are. So um, what motivates you to get up every morning and teach? I try to remember that every day is a gift and that I am in charge of my daily routine. And when I saw this slide, even though it says wake up every Monday knowing that you can create something amazing, I think every day I want you to wake up and think that you have the possibility to create something amazing. So adapting, modifying, strategizing, these are all points of change in our life, both our personal life, our professional life, and we can take charge of all these and we search for ways to create to meet or reach new goals and objectives. 
Maybe we're teaching a new concept, a topic, or, or idea, or we just want to bring a fresh new look at an old mundane activity. I wonder, how do we get creative? So it's great to be alive. And I want you to remember that every day is a gift and we're only promised here and now. However, I want you to be inspired in that we can all wonder, wonder what it is we can do in each moment. And I think that Karen and, and um, Amanda both touched on it. We have a chance every single day to touch lives. And one way in which we can do that is to make modifications and adaptations to what it is we do. So we're going to do what is called a KWL. And it's just an activity um, that we do for all kinds of things, all kinds of concepts, um, starting a new subject, starting a new topic, starting a new chapter. Um, many, many people use them, but I want to show you how to, how to use it in just a variety of ways, but we're going to use it right now. So if you would, if you have a piece of paper near you or a, a access to a, a Word document, um, I actually could. Uh... So all you do is make three columns. On the left, you write, what do you know, which is the K, or you can just put K in the first column on the left. And in the middle column, what do you want to know, W. And in the right column, L, what, do you, what did you learn? Now we're gonna look um, right here and now about the first two columns. So in, if you have the ability to write down, or if you can just think of in your own head, what right now do you know about adapting and modifying activities? Or drop it in the chat. If you can't paper pencil it or, or document it, drop something in the chat that you know about adapting or modifying an activity. Anybody? Anybody have no clue? Okay, engaging, differentiating learning. Used to the meet the needs of the student, good. Rigor shouldn't be compromised, absolutely. Good ones. All right, what do you want to know? Let's go to the W. What do you want to know about adapting and modifying activities? Good, Michelle, breaking down into sections step by step.
All right, you want more strategies? Different methods to meet student needs. If it is helpful. All right, styles, best practices, styles, okay. The best way to keep that regular to accommodate students' needs. All right, relevance. Oh, I like that. Can uh, Roberta, can you uh, elaborate a little bit more? Okay, relevance, activities to how it relates to the students. Okay, very good. All right, so what we know, what we want to know, which brings me to who I am. Once you get to know me, you'll know that I break a lot of rules and not rules like against the law rules, but rules, for instance, <clears throat> if, if somebody says, this is the way you have to do it, I say, is, oh, is that right? Well, could we try? Well, my background is in special education and many of the wording and the language that we use when we say adaptation or modification comes from the special education world. Well, we're not necessarily, you may have students with special needs or accommodations, or if you have adults um, and they disclose that they're on a 504 plan, you may have to make adaptations or modifications. So you may very well need this information for that reason. But we can, on an everyday basis, adapt and modify activities to actually improve the cognition and move our, our, our topics and our wording, all of our short-term objectives and content to long-term memory for our students. So it seems that my underlying motto has always been rules were made to be broken. From an early age, I learned the value and the thousands of uses of duct tape and bailing wire. I have also discovered the high importance, the necessity of using color and kinesthesis as components by which we move our short-term knowledge into long-term memory. After all, that is the ultimate goal. In my mind, teaching for mastery and beyond while we're having fun. How, how, how do we fascinate, intrigue, immerse our students in our content area so that um, we get our class to learn. It, it does seem like a dog and pony show, but they've got to have fun in order to learn. And one of the easiest ways to keep your uh, curriculum fresh and keep it from stagnating is to adapt or modify or an extend at least one component from simple to complex. I'm often asked, how do I come up with these crazy ideas? First of all, I rarely reinvent the wheel. I simply embellish it. Did you know that they have colored and patterned duct tape now? My mind was blown. So here's an example of one way that I personally come up with my ideas and I don't reinvent the wheel. One Christmas, now mind you, I come from a family of seven brothers and one sister. So we're very large. So we always have activities and we always do crazy stuff. So from a crazy Christmas game, I came up with an, an activity that I call dicey um, that I use uh, I've used it in my new teacher academy almost every year for the last three or four years. Um, 
and have shown ways to use, and I'll demonstrate that to you shortly, but I want to show you this video real quick of how I, uh, let's see if I can get it to pop up. <clears throat> this is just a few seconds of it. I won't make you. Okay, so we had so much fun with this game. I got to thinking, how could we use that in a classroom? Because it is so much fun, but how could we use that to actually have actual learning go on? So this activity um, involves teamwork. It can uh, involve assessment, vocabulary. You can use it to learn procedures and so much more. My vision was to use it with anatomy and physiology and medical terminology, but really um, it's endless the way that it functions. Whoop. We don't need to watch that again. So um, this is a best practice that we're using now. Um, and I just explained that, that it is uh, based on teamwork. So the way the resources sources are very simple. You need a dice for each group and you need some sort of either worksheet or paper pencil. And what you do is you take, um, if you want just to do it off, off the cuff, you know, say they're, you're doing an activity and you need a brain break, like the girls talked about in the previous um, uh, session before me, um, you take a piece of paper and you fold it vertically. So long ways like a hot dog bun. You fold it in half and then crease it. So you have two halves of the paper. You write one through 20 on each half. So each student has a paper folded in half vertically numbered one through 20. Now this activity can take up to 30 minutes depending on, on how you use it or you could shorten it by adding a time limit. So paper, pencil uh, and a die. That's all that you need for this activity. So the way that it's played, <clears throat> it's really quite simple. One person gets a die that starts with it. Every person has a paper pencil. That, and I told you, they number it from one to 20. So you predetermine two numbers. Let's say, for example, a one and a five. The goal is for the person with the die to roll a one or a five. When they do, they get to hand the die off to the next person in line, handing it to the right. While everybody else is writing on their paper, for instance, if we're doing med terms, um, everybody's saying, well, say we're doing, we're learning root words. Everybody's writing as fast as they can while they're rolling the die, as many med terms as they can come up with in their head. So everybody's writing. Once they roll the one or five, they pass it to the right. So this goes on until either you predetermine, you know, one person comes up with 20 answers or the whole team comes up with 20 answers. So the game continues that way. And you can check the answers if you wanna check it for accuracy. Um, so it's just a really fun way to, to do med terms. Now, can anybody think of a way to change that activity to make it a little more difficult? Drop it in the chat if you can. Okay. Okay, the meaning of the terms as well, perfect. say the, the term word and have them spell, okay? Terms only starting with a certain letter, okay, perfect. I love it. See, even more ideas. 
See, you all are already adapting and modifying an activity and you didn't even know it. Instead of word parts, use complete medical words for a body system. Oh, I love it. Okay, those are all wonderful ideas. So now I'm gonna throw a wrench in it. What if everybody's, everybody gets, can do any of those ideas, those great ideas you just thought of? For instance, we're writing, instead of word parts, we're doing uh, complete medical words for a body system. And instead of just passing the die when you get the number, you have to pass your paper, everybody has to pass their paper too. So what happens? You're writing on somebody else's paper because what do students do? You only write down what you can remember. So if they're, you're looking at somebody else's paper for the first time and they already have all the terms you've written, you're stumped. So it's just one more way to an ad advance an activity by modifying and changing it. It's really fun because when you throw a wrench in something, people, the students go, they're gonna take my paper? Yeah, they're gonna take your paper and your paper and your paper. Well, not only are you requiring them to see other people's answer, but then they get to know, oh yeah, I remember that one, but I forgot it for a moment. And yeah, and they also have to learn to read other people's handwriting. That's really good. I, can't, I come from the world before the EMAR. So in the hospital where you had to learn to read the doctor's handwriting to read the orders. Oh, I went to the secretary every time and said, this is Dr. Um, Gibson's order, what does it say? And they had to read it to me every time. So yeah, you, you have an appreciation for other people's handwriting. So this is just one crazy example of how Dicey came from an activity from a Christmas game, a family Christmas game. And you can make the difficulty range from beginner to advanced. So let's get into the nuts and bolts of it. So Karen, will you tell me if there's something I need to answer specifically? Yeah, I'm going to answer this one. I think okay. I got it. Okay, thank you. All right. So how do we take this activity or any activity and make it more advanced by adapting or modifying it? And we just talked about it. You know, round one, we're writing words. Round two, we're adding prefixes or suffixes. Round three, we're making those words into sentences or we're, you, you know, we're changing the time limit. Those are all examples of how we can adapt and modify just one activity. So adaptation, as I mentioned before, and, and modification, the language comes from special education. But beyond that, Adaptation is best known as accommodation. So when we think of that, we look at it as how. Adaptation changes how a student learns the material or concept. So if you answer that question, how, that's an accommodation. So if you change the, how did you change the format? That's an adaptation. How did you change the time? How did you change the arrangement? How did you change the communication? That is an adaptation. <clears throat> Here's where we look at the hows. In the physical arrangement, in the communication, and in the ad adapting instruction. Always the how. 
So how about modification? We answer the question, what? Modification is what a student is taught. We modify what is taught. Do we make it easier or harder? One of the things in the chat early on was the important thing is to keep the rigor there. And it is important to keep the rigor up. But um, I know that uh, Karen talked about chunking and chunking is so important to get material and information and content from short-term memory to long-term memory. And that is answering, that's a modification. That is chunking, giving information in a, in a smaller amount. So repetition is an example. Um, giving the same information in a variety of ways, doing it, uh, seeing it, doing it, teaching it, modeling how you do something. So if you give a direction, if you say, okay, we are going to um, go to the lab and we're going to, you know, um, do a blood draw on a mannequin. If you give that direction only verbal, what percentage of the students are you gonna reach? It's a difficult, it depends on the makeup of the students. But a modification to your teaching style needs to be, and something you need to think about, is you always need to give a direction in two forms. And it's easy for us just to vocalize it. But we need to either put it on the whiteboard as we're saying it so somebody can read it as you're saying it. Or, you, or if it's on your, um, your uh, bell ringer or on your agenda, your daily agenda, agenda or your daily routine. And one of the things with modification is that if you will alternate between a, a quiet task and an active task, that also helps with that brain drain, which pushes to the mastery and keeps up the rigor of your content. All right. So in adaptation, let's look at our assignments. When we give an assignment, an, an example of an adaptation in an assignment is we're asking them to be detailed with a drawing. Not only are we act, asking them to detail the drawing, but we're asking them to label it. So for instance, if you're doing a muscle group, you're not only labeling the muscle group, but you're ask, asking them to write where are the origin and the insertion of the muscle group. So that's an adaptation of your assignment. That's one way. And that also increases the rigor of the work. Another adaptation of assignment. And this is a big one. And the girls touched on it on both of the sessions before. There is no way you can teach everything in a textbook that you need to teach. You have got to, as the instructor, glean what it is they need to know versus what it is that's nice for them to know. If you're teaching a program that requires a, a, a licensure or a certification examination, they need to know a certain content information. And then if you have a chance, the nice to know part is a filler. And then, um, and then of course, that last one there. Uh, was it you, Karen, or maybe Amanda or both um, talked about teaching in the flip classroom? Oh uh, yeah, I definitely flip my classroom because then okay. it gives me more time and they've heard it just like you have up there. Yes. Um, they hear the vocabulary before they come into the room. Yes. 
So um, adapting your assignment. So if that's exactly right, Karen, if they hear the vocabulary, meaning they have studied it how in whatever form that they study at home, in your assignment at home, they look at a lesson or a video or whatever it is in your flipped classroom before you have the lesson for them. So they prepared coming into the lesson. Then there's not a foreign, it's not a foreign language to them. All right. So um, modifications then in assignments. Shorten the task. Here it is where, you know, the task is instead of uh, writing a 10 page essay, we're going to write a five page. You know, provide suggestions. Instead of just, you know, all right, go read chapter five and, um, you know, write a 10 page essay. Give them some specific suggestions, some great direction on what they should do. Those are way to modify your assignments. And again, multiple forms of direction. All right. Classroom environment, and this is, I'm speaking of the physical environment. Vary the pace, <clears throat> the fast, the slow. Uh, was Amanda, was it you? Or no, I think it was Karen, talked about having uh, your, a place to go for if you miss an assignment or if you're late or to hand in a, a project or an assignment. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. okay, so it is, absolutely important to have this available. I also recommend assign a, a note-taking buddy so that not only if you miss the assignment, you know where to go find it, the stuff, but you have a buddy that can show their the notes that they took and can go over them with them. Another fun activity to do in your classroom, you don't have to do all the work. Have your students design and play a game that is a simulated game of something that they have learned in class. And of course, time. Modifications in your classroom environment. Movement opportunities. This is where I know Amanda talked about it. We have, we have got to get away from lecturing all the time. We've got to have some time for movement. And I don't just mean um, standing up and walking. I mean, the activity needs to involve movement. We've got to put time limits on things. Move your seating around. And I don't mean just assigned seats. I mean, your physical environment. Um, of course, with COVID, um, and some of you are virtual, so that's a whole different thing. But if you're in a physical environment and you have the ability to rearrange your classroom sometimes, do that. And your, your environment needs to be physically, um, visually pleasing, aesthetically pleasing. Um, and then teaching strategies. This is what all the teachers, you know, when you first start, you're trying to do your thing. Key points. Make sure that when you make a key point, that your students are aware that you're making a key point. This is something you need to know and why it's important. Giving them an example of something, you know, in your situation. Teach a mnemonic device and show them why and how it's used because students don't know how to do it. They don't even know what a mnemonic is. Sorry, that was my alarm to hurry up and <laughs> again, looky there, chunk material. You've got to restate a concept, give it in shorter, shorter amounts. We've also got to give them a signal to focus. Um, just like Karen needed the, the alarm, <laughs> students need an alarm as well. Um, we've got to cue them. So if a student has just about got the, the right answer, we want them to give verbal feedback. So let's cue them. Let's go ahead and nudge them to get there. Get the hands-on activities going. They need some warning if you're getting ready to move to something new. Don't just stop and start. Let them know that there's going to be a progression. Daily routine is vital. 
and checking progress often is key. That's where those um, um, bell ringers and exit tickets, you don't have to grade every single thing, but you as an instructor will know at a glance if they're getting the material. That's how you keep the rigor up. Um, Susie, Natalie yeah. wanted to know, do you have any suggestions when you have like larger classes or over 20 to get them up and moving, um, maybe even with some of the restrictions that we have now with social distancing? Yes, one of the best ways to do it when you have a large group is to group. So to have all your, you can't lockstep, lockstep meaning you're teaching all the students the same thing all the time. You have, say you have 20 students, group them into groups of three or four, and all four groups are doing something different. That's where the flipped classroom, they do the homework, you come in, and then you get to move from group to group to group and help them out. Um, with the assignment that you have for them in the classroom. I hope that answered your question. So let's, let's go to uh, what you've learned today. I hope that you're able to look back at the, you know, what you knew, what you want to know, and that you've learned a little bit about what it is to adapt and modify your activities because it doesn't just mean one thing, it means multiple things and it could be crazy fun things and it could be something simple or something more elaborate. I hope you've learned something today. It's been my great pleasure um, and honor to be a part of this group. This is my contact information. Um, I'm always available by phone or email. Um, and if there's any questions in the chat, I'll be glad to answer them. I can pull that up now. And hopefully we'll be doing more of this soon. And your KWL, you can apply it to something as simple as, uh, you know, what, what did you learn about an activity that you just completed. The, so what did you learn? Many of the teachers use this. Um, you can do it daily. You can do, use your KWL daily. So you can have the students fill out, what did you learn today daily? You could do it weekly. You could do it per topic. You could do it at the end of a subject. Any other questions? I wanted to show you one other thing. Um, so I did it as a QR code so you could upload it with your uh, cell phones. Uh, this is something, uh, many of our teachers use it a lot, our doodle pages. I'm a firm believer that color and creativity move concepts and ideas to long-term memory. And one of the ways in which you can do that is by taking notes in color. And these doodle pages, you can um, download them and then you can create a doodle page uh, subject specific so that um, students can take notes based on whatever it is you're teaching, whether it's biology or if it's um, you know, anatomy physiology or if it's sports medicine or if it's uh, nursing concepts 
whatever. It could be very specific, but they're actually getting to doodle while they're listening to you. Um, so it's a very, very, very good way to move their memory to the long term. Cynthia, I see you have a question about um, do the doodle pages cost anything? I know that I pull a lot of images from um, Teachers Pay Teachers. It's a math giraffe, I think. But there's a bunch of free ones out yeah. there and you can even create your own. I pulled up for um, fire safety because I think it covers that across the board. Um, I pulled up like a clip art image of a fire hydrant and a clip art image of a fire hat. And then I just put like the acronym race and then the acronym pass in it. And that's the doodle pages or yeah. um, something even as simple as just, uh, cre you know, pulling some clip art off of Google slides or whatever uh, yeah. program you're using. Um, yeah, they, they do. Um, yes. And the, yes, the Nishi curriculum enhancements. Thank you, Amanda. Um, mm -hmm. We have all kinds of, if you're not familiar with our enhancements, um, it, it does come um, at a price, but it's a great price. Um, because we keep them updated and um, we, we've just rolled out some really great stuff and you're getting the benefits of it right now, getting to hear some really get, great uh, speakers. Uh, the next two speakers coming up uh, are going to give you some actual activities and classroom things that they do. Um, Yep. So um, I think we're going to take like a five minute bathroom break if you need to stand up and stretch real quick before Laura comes on and introduces the next one. Um, yes, Roberta, um, Nishi's got some amazing resources. And if you're a member of the HSEA, which you all should be, um, yes. but if you're not, join that because I know that that Google Drive has some doodle pages that I personally have used and dropped in there. Um, and I think some others as well. And we also have the Facebook page too. Um, so there's lots of ideas floating around there, but if you want to go ahead and take like a five minute bathroom break, yes, Nancy, it's $45 only, um, which is a lot cheaper than what I just ordered chocolate for. So, um, five minute bathroom break, Nancy is what I just announced. And then we're going to do the next two speakers. She didn't Thank know you all. Speakers. Appreciate it. Thank you, Susie, so much. It was great information. All righty. Um, I know that we all have students that have the accommodations and modifications, and I need it as well because I'm squirrely. Well, so. and the thing is, <laughs> it is, it doesn't have to be, it can be for everyone. I know, because I'm telling you, I have to have the, all those breaks and I have to hear directions and see it and read it. And mm -hmm. um, my students laugh because it's, you know, they get it so many ways that they're like, oh my gosh. Yes. And I'm like, but yes. you need it, but I need it. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. You guys have a blessed week. Thank you, Susie, again. Uh -huh. um, Again, we're just gonna take um, just a few moments before the next session starts at 3.15. So get up, stretch your legs. Um, if you need to refill your water or whatever beverage you may be drinking because it's Saturday and it's game day, do that. Um, but take a you know a moment or two and maybe even see if I can find some music because nobody wants to hear me sing. Um, my kids will tell you that's not a pleasure. That would be like torture for a couple of minutes. Although I don't know how well this will work. It's probably a good thing that you can't see my Pandora selection as it is. But look, it came on some good 80s music. Gosh, I love some 80s music. My daughter's on just the other side of the laptop now, acting like she's singing. Thank goodness she's not singing out loud too. <laughs> We're all gonna be 
Um, super excited when this bathroom break is over. <laughs> And this is also what happens when they leave me in charge for a few minutes. I hijack everything. <laughs> if you guys have any questions while we're waiting, please drop them in the chat. Um, my kids like to go, it's just right down below. You can drop it in the chat, hit the like button and the subscribe button. <laughs> I think that's more for YouTube. We could always do like a uh, slide show of my kids' pictures. That's what my students hear sometimes. This is what we call one of those brain breaks that you get in class. The nice brain break. We have a snack break in a minute. I know that personally I'm working on some uh, lesson plans. I do, um, I do think we have some doodle pages in the curriculum enhancement drive. It may just be in the overalls um, portion of it. Let me pull, I can check on that while we're on a break for a moment. If they're not in the enhancements, I know that they are within the, um, Yes, there are. So it is in the curriculum enhancements. It is under the general classroom folder. Um, so it's going to be in the first um, enhancements that you download. Um, mine's called part one. When I click on that, it is um, Folder B for general classroom help, and there's a doodles in there. Oh my gosh, yay, Laura, she got second. That's amazing. Now we can um, get some good pictures of the goats too. I love some goats. Our ag class has some in, in the barn on site. And man, let me tell you, I want some goat yoga. Um, some little baby goats are amazing. I don't know if I've got a picture. I think I do have a picture of our center's goats. I go down there and when I'm having a bad day, let me tell you. Okay, so it is time. So I'm gonna stop the music and let Laura introduce the next speaker. Hey guys, there's nothing like a fun Saturday, huh? Well, we're so glad you're here with us still. And um, I just want to, yes, my girl, just one second. Woo, we're really excited for. Her. And we are heading out of the State Fair of Oklahoma right now, but I want to bring to you another one of Oklahoma's finest. It's Luann Lively. So, Luann, are you ready to roll? No. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Now she's Thank gonna give y'all she's gonna give you South Carolina girls a run for your money on her accent. So <laughs> that's right. That's, exactly that's right. right. Love you, Luann. Go ahead. Thank Thanks. All right. Thank you. Um hello. I can hear echo, so I guess it's yours too. And <clears throat> I'm Luann Lively. I'm from Durant, Oklahoma, and I do have an accent. I'm sorry. I will try to be better. Hey, I'm going to put up my PowerPoint in just a second and talk to you about today about how I introduce health science curriculum into the ninth and 10th grade and also how I have classroom management or do classroom management for my younger students and introduce anatomy and host into my class. So. Um, this is going to be kind of laid back. So if you have questions, please interrupt me. If you don't agree with me, sorry, I'm kidding. If you, if you have any comments, please just talk and let's, um, see what you have to say. And I'm going to get started. So 
Let me share my PowerPoint with you. Okay. So, um, okay. So this is, again, let me just say this, how to introduce health science into the ninth and 10th grade. I teach at a comprehensive high school in Durant, Oklahoma, and I have about 140 students for five hours. And um, I try to get them interested into the health field. And then um, classroom management. So a little bit about myself. I have been teaching, well, this is starting my 23rd year in Durant. Um, I have only taught at Durant High School. I, my parents were both teachers. I did not want to teach, so I went into the medical field. I, I was a medical technologist for 16 years. Um, my, then I had two kids, and it, teaching became more what I needed to do instead of working at the, at the hospital. I've been a not, uh, cheer coach for 19 years. Yes. Um, Luann, yeah. I'm going to stop you for a moment. We cannot see your PowerPoint. Okay. Hold on one second. Come back over here. And, um, give me one second. Let me see. Just hit present right here. Yeah. Start. Escape. We went over this yesterday, so. Drag that one over here, maybe. Okay. Hit share screen again. No, over here. Click on over here. Okay, give me a second. Uh, and yeah, click on that. Now, can you see it? Yes, we're good now. Okay, okay, good. Um, and so, um, I'm gonna go down. So I, now you guys know why I'm crazy because I have been a, the cheer coach for 19 years. Um, I think um, it's a calling more than anything. So there you go. I also um, have been a student council sponsor for one year. That is when I took a break from cheer, so I couldn't stand to sit, sit still, so I took on cheer, on student council, so there you go. And now I have two grandchildren, a four-year-old and an eight-week-old, and so that's where my heart is heading. So I, I'm trying to get just classroom only and not cheer and student council and anything else, but right now that's what I'm doing. So today, my objectives for you guys and I know Karen and Susie have said some stuff that I'm going to say, so sorry, um, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit different than what they said, but uh, along the same lines. So I want to discuss my uh, classroom management uh, for younger kids. Um, I have so many freshmen, they come into class and I don't feel like they know how to do anything. So I have to be very direct with them and tell them, I'm going to tell you, uh, demonstrate to you about my interactive notebook that I have in my classroom and what I do for my classroom with my interactive notebook and how that helps with my classroom management. I'm going to introduce to you guys um, anatomy and clay um, the, and how I incorporate that into my classroom and also how I in integrate POSA every Friday into my classroom and you'll love that. Um, my classroom management. I was thinking about this this morning. Um, number one, for me to be prepared, you I, and I find out the days that I come in and I'm running behind and I'm not prepared from the day before, it affects my classroom. And so me being prepared helps. So when they come in, they know exactly what to do. They get a, a note paper from the back, they get taped because I want it taped into their notebook. So I have all that laid out so they come in and get that. Um, the second thing I said, you have to train your students. You have to train them for exactly what you want them to do. So we do interactive notebooks. I Every day I come in, I have their papers ready for the back. 
and on the on my board i write down exactly what i want them to do with that piece of paper how i want it folded and what page in their notebooks i want it attached and so as a with freshmen i have to tell them every day and and i think we're six weeks into school and i'm still having to do this daily because i'm i've got most of them are know exactly what we're doing. I've got a few that still have not caught on and I've left them a pink sticky note in their notebook to see me Monday in class because we've got to figure out why, why they're not where I need them to be. And number three, and Karen said this, she talked a lot about relationship. I think it is super important to build a relationship with your students. Um, she sent out note cards to them and I just try to um, stand at the door and my main objective is to learn their names. And that's what I tell them. Remember, I have 140 of you. So if you're walking down the hall and I holler your name, it's because I'm trying to remember your name. So I think building a relationship is very, very important. Um, my interactive notebook, the whole purpose of an interactive notebook in my class is to get the students organized and get and keep them organized um the majority of the time if i um can't find or if they can't find their note their papers it's because they're in the bottom of their backpacks and i'm like empty out your backpacks so um tony mclemore and i um we we co-teach here she teaches health science two three and four and i teach one and so um, we started talking about interactive notebooks and she introduced it first and I was like, this is perfect for my freshmen to help get them organized and help them understand why um, they need to keep everything together. And it is helpful to grade. So an interactive notebook is a must, especially with freshmen and sophomores. Um, also to help with my classroom management, if they're coming in and getting their notebooks and they're getting their papers, then they um, have a task at a hand and they know what they're supposed to be doing and that cuts down on a lot of um, play that they want to do and chit chat. I also have it right next to where they pick up their paper, a, a phone holder and they have to put their cell phones in there too. So that kind of cuts down on problems. Um, also my interactive notebook is to help our HOSA students um, stay organized gives them something to write down all of their notes and i'll tell you more about that in a few minutes but um it helps with organization of their notes so when it comes testing testing time they can come back and just scan through all the notes and i am kind of old school i think it's important that they write stuff down in their notebook and that gives them stuff that they can um, come back and recall and look at um, on interactive notebooks I put up here a five subject notebook and a three ring binder. So last year with my freshmen and sophomores, I tried to do a three ring binder and they just can't handle that. They can't handle um, hole punching their paper and putting it in there and getting it in the right order. So I went back to a five subject notebook and I have them to take their notebooks. I don't know if you can see this and tape all of their stuff in here. So, and I, and I provide the tape for them. Um, also on their interactive notebook, the very first page um, that I have them to do is a piece of paper. I'll show you that in just a second. It's called All About Me. Um, it has just random stuff. They get to color it. They get to do all kinds of stuff to this page. And I go back as I'm grading notebooks and I'll find something new. Um, one of the things is their favorite candy. And I, I put my favorite candies chocolate. So I might try to say, hey, I didn't know you, you know, why would you like licorice? I hate licorice. You should always like chocolate or something. So they know I've read their all about me paper. Um, that's building a relationship with them too. Also in their interactive notebook, I do um, two pages and I'm gonna have to have more pages so we're going to i'm going to really confuse them later when we fill up our table of content but every day they come in they pick their paper up they get their notebooks out 
and I tell them what page to attach that. And then they have to go to the front of their notebook in their table of content and write down what page it is and what, what it includes. The, um, it includes the title and the page number for each page. So um, I'll let them use this on their test sometimes and it's easier for me to go back and say, well, you, when we did this, it was on page 26. So that's kind of helped too. And again, they come into the classroom, they get their notebooks and their paper out and they add it to their table of content. And this is my table of content for this year. And so um, uh, you can see on page 15 that I've got a big X through it. We didn't do anything on that day as far as attaching stuff. And I wanted to, I graded that up to that page. I had graded more, but I still had students that were far off. So I told everybody take page 15 in your notebook and make a big X and then start the next page where there's two pages. And I want you to put page 16 on the left hand side of your notebook and page 17 on the right hand side of your notebook. So we can all be again on the same page. So that's why you see that. So every day they're having to add. And I told them what we're doing is we're building a book. We're learning how to stay organized. We're learning how to to do recall if I wanted to come back and say, look up HOSA page 14, they, they would know exactly uh, what page we're talking about. And also they're, they're ready to be in lecture. As freshmen, I give them a piece of paper every day to put in their notebooks because they, they do not know what's important on note taking. So I help them out with that too. So um, these three pages are for my interactive notebook. Um, this is the All About Me page. So like I said, I even color my All About Me page when I am sitting in here waiting for them. I do supply crayons or map pencils. And if they want anything else, then they have to bring their own. Um, I'll tell them, I need you to color it. I need you to write, I need you to write down all this stuff. You never know when I might bring food in here. I at least know when their birthdays are. I try to find something every day or every week about a different person so that I can talk to them about it. Also, a freshman and a sophomore need to know why, why are we doing this? Why are we making an interactive notebook? And so on the right hand side, you can see the guides to an interactive notebook and, and what it is. It is to help you get organized. It is to have usable working documents. It's to help you with a test. It's to help you um, keep up with your paperwork. And so when I give them that, they get it. Not really most of them get it, but there's still some that don't believe it. So I have them attach those into their notebooks too. And the middle one is the um, how I would grade the interactive notebook and what I'm looking for. Um, I'll just tell you this, girls are very colorful, guys are just black and white for the most part in my class. So um, I just have to make sure that I grade it accordingly and um, know that they're they're not gonna go and, and put any more color into it. Now, sometimes, sometimes they want to. And so I have that for them because um, they don't carry it with them. So those are some papers that I put in for for the very first days of school. Um, here's some other papers that I've included that I do in my interactive notebook. You can see on the right hand side, um, this was a girl's paper and how she took notes. And when we were going over HOSA and how she incorporated that into her studying. Um, the middle one, I think setting goals and I, I go back to goal setting all the time I um, want them to know why it's important to do goal setting. And so um, we discuss questions, we discuss what um, different different ways and different things that they need to, to know about. And I'm always showing them how I get up every morning and I write down stuff that I've got to accomplish and I, that's a daily goal. But where do you see yourself at the end of the semester or how about this week? And so I have them to try to recall that. And then a really good movie to show on goal setting is Rudy. Um, I always show it at the beginning of, of the year. It is football season here in Durant. And so 
um, they think I'm just showing a football movie, but I stop it along the way and I show them and talk to them about all the people that were important to Rudy and who encouraged him, who didn't encourage him and how he still overcame. And they don't believe me till the end of the movie. It's a true story and how he finally, his goal came true or his dream and he got to play for Notre Dame and he's the only football player um, that's ever been carried off the football field at Notre Dame. So that's kind of a, a cool story. And um, it comes about it. I play it about the time also. So it's twofold for me. They get to watch it and I get to do my salary and teaching or some of my paperwork that's due. So that's kind of a plus both ways. That's my goal. How about that? And the one on the left, I give to my students when we start talking about um, HOSA or no, anatomy and clay. And I want them to know that uh, it's a privilege to get to do um, anatomy and clay. And I have torsicans now for every one of my students. Um, I give every one of my students clay, but I want them to know how much it costs and, and why I think it's important that they take ownership with this. And if they see the cost, so far, knock on wood, I've never had to have anybody to help replace this or um, me have to charge anybody anything or hold them accountable. So that's good. But I want them to name their mannequin. I want them to give them a birthday. And they all, they always don't like the death day, but that's when we take the mannequin apart and take all the clay off and clean it. So they have to come back to that. So that is a birth certificate day. Um, I got this when I went to Nishi several years ago. Somebody put that up there and I took a picture of it. So you're more than welcome to screenshot that or change it up. These are some other things that I do in the middle is the Rudy paper that I was talking about. It's got all kinds of stuff that asks about, we talk about Rudy and then I incorporate that into their life. And how how is that? something what Rudy had to go through. Are you going through that? What are you going to do to change that to make it positive? Um, I think Susie said earlier about doodle pages and I'm a doodler also. So I have to make stuff up for myself. So this is my doodle page that I made up when the first or second day that we go over the syllabus in my class. And I and I, if I write it down that I can remember it. So I have them writing stuff down and we put it in their notebooks also. Um, why dress code, why we have homework, if they're allergic to anything, because um, when we start going into our DHO book, we're gonna talk about communication and my class, I want them to be more excited about the health field more excited about all the different careers. So um, we do communication skills and I talk to them about why it's so important to be able to communicate. They have to make a peanut butter and a jelly, peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, I make them just out of the clear blue one day, I'll come in and say, get out a piece of paper and I want you to tell me how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And some, some kids need to ask lots of questions. I'm like, listen, just write down the directions. And so I come back after they turn it in and I highlight if they told me to get a plate or a, a knife or a spoon or a fork or whatever. And so then one day later, after we've talked about communication, I tell them why it's so important to communicate correctly. Don't assume people know anything. And that is so, um, um, if you go into surgery, we don't cut the wrong leg off. So, um, they have to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And that's my fun day for me is so that I can watch them um, struggle on, well, you knew that I needed a knife. And I was like, I told you, I don't know how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So they have to come up with ways to put the peanut butter on and put the jelly on. I do give them a plate, even if they don't say that. So I can, and I handle all of the utensils. I squirt the jelly on their plate and I, spoon the peanut butter out so I don't have to worry about them touching anything. So that's why I wrote down allergies. I, my main objective, are you allergic to peanut butter? And if so, then I try to find something um, for, for those people to um, get to do while we're making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So um, 
I'm, I'm not looking at my chat, so if anybody's got anything, somebody let me know, okay? Um, another thing I do in my classes, um, I want them to explore all the different um, health fields. And so when they come into my class, all the girls want to be, to be a pediatric nurse, which that is great. I'm glad somebody likes to do that because that's not me. I don't want to listen to babies cry all day long. But so we use this and this is a um, healthcare career exploration and it is a video and it's got, I think, 60, 65 different videos about different careers. So it talks about a girl is in a wreck and she um, all the people that she sees from the time she's in a wreck until she um, gets to go home and doesn't have to have anything done. So um, it starts off with an EMT and a paramedic and it goes to a recreational um, therapist. It goes to a massage therapist an acupuncturist. So all different careers and it comes with a workbook. Um, I don't use the workbook. I make up my own questions as as I've gone along and use this. Um, again, it has 32 different careers that you can um, uh, explore with. And so these are some of my uh, papers that I go along with. And I we do them a lot as as we'll watch the video. And then I have them doing some research afterwards. You know, what is what is a normal pulse? What is a normal respiration? So these are these are some of the papers that I've come up with to go along with the healthcare careers exploration. So um, it takes probably four weeks from start to finish because I only have my students 48 minutes. And so from the time they they come in until um, we complete like uh, video series or module one, it might take three or four days for us to go through that. And we discuss different stuff and I make them do some research over the careers. And um, after we watch all the videos, then I have them to come back and they have to choose one of the 32 careers and do research over it. And I give them a list of questions that I want them to incorporate into their uh, one page research paper. So. Um, that's a really good video. I don't watch it all the way through. I um, will incorporate different stuff through it and on HOSA, for HOSA Friday, so that takes up some time too. And the next thing I want to talk about is how I incorporate anatomy and clay into my curriculum with my ninth graders. Um, this is a picture of me and a picture of Tony McLemore. We went to a workshop in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm telling you, it's probably the best, hardest workshop I've ever been to. We we uh, built the whole, all the body systems on this mannequin in two days. My hands hurt. It was a it was a long time getting back into or through the airport with clay all over us. So um, they told us that, so we got there early. But we started purchasing mannequins and torsicans through our grant from the state of Oklahoma. And we now have enough for Tony to have the stand-up models. And I have all of the Torsicans for um, each one of my students in my class. And so we are getting all that through a grant. So look in your state and see what kind of grant you have. I'm telling you, it's great stuff. But I also um, use a lot of the hands-on body systems that I got from Starla Ewing. Um, as I've gone to some of her classes. So this is us building um, our mannequins. This is in my classroom. So this looks like a big mess and it usually is, but I have a rack for every class. Um, each student gets to have their own torsican. They have to leave it in class. They get their own set of tools and I provide um, a Ziploc baggie and they put their names on their tools. And I also provide a Ziploc baggie for them. At, at the beginning of this, they get clay and I, I assign them five different colors for them to get. And they have to carry their clay with them um, so that if they, this was last year also, if they went on distant learning, they could build whatever we're building um, and not attach it into their torsican until they came back to school. 
and that really worked out well for me and because I had a lot of students quarantined last year I only had two that were positive with COVID and so um, I, I always told them on Infinite Campus if you test positive finish working with your clay at home but do not bring that clay back to school email me and let me know that you're quarantined with covid you're going to take pictures and send me your models and then throw that in the trash and we'll give you new that way that's the only way that i knew that would be safe for all of us to continue to work with clay i only had two people that that happened to so that was a good thing so the students adopt the torsican they give their they give their skeleton a name and they write it in pencil on that. That's another good thing about these is you can write all over them and one of those Mr. Clean uh, magic erasers wipes all that stuff off. And so I buy that at the end of the year. And um, like I said, we build, they keep them in class and I have enough of these for five hours now. And so that's a great thing. Um, you can see these are some more of the racks that I keep in my class. Um, last year, I didn't have enough of the torsicans, so we applied for another, for a grant. Tony and I shared a grant this year, and so I got 25 more torsicans, so I won't have to have the stand-up models. Um, I used the stand-up models when my second hour class last year because I had more sophomores and juniors in there, so um, they were able to handle that better. Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, I also keep um, those pencil boxes and I'll set them out sometimes um, that have extra tools in them in case they didn't bring their tools or I always have new students that are like, you didn't give me any tools. So, so I've got that. I always keep extra clay at the front of my classroom in case they've run out. And so um, this is a great way to teach and to show them how this works. Um, with the anatomy and clay, it comes with a DVD um, and we use that and I use that in my class. Um, it, we play the video, we'll stop it, we'll um, put that clay on there and it also has notes in there. So I'm trying to teach my students how to take notes. And so I'll say, okay, write this down on page, whatever in, in the notebook so that um, they have notes and they know what we're doing. I also, they also found out how important it was because some kids weren't taking notes last year. And um, not only did they get a grade for the notes, but they got to use those notes that they took on a test. So they are tested over this, but that that um, DVD came with it. And these are my torsicans. I, listen, I love these. They're much easier for my freshmen to handle. I don't have to worry about the tall ones falling over. Um, it has taken me a little bit of time to um, figure out how to reduce some of it as far as um, where to put like the kidneys. I set the kidneys up or laid them down and it took up too much room. So I took another class and they said, no, set it up. So these are... Um, I have 125 of these. They're amazing. Um, the kids love them. They can't wait to get started on them this year. They didn't come with a, a DVD, so I've had to redo some of it so I, and show them how to do it. They have to be shown step by sh step by step how to do this because they just can't. They just can't make decisions on their own. So I'm hoping that slowly they'll start being able to make be able to do this on their own um, this is some of the other stuff that i i gleaned this is looks like a big mess unless you know what you're looking at inside of the heart and we um, did the circulatory system so this was one of the students and this is how i graded them too i would um stick um uh, uh pins into the different areas and say tell me what this is what is this main uh, valve coming out? What are these uh, red and blue dots inside? What, where is the right atrium? And so this was easy. Um, this one on the left, this person did a black lung. They were like, well, my parents smoke. So this is probably what their lung looks like. And so it was kind of, it's kind of neat. And you can see on the right side, they took a pencil. That's all it is. And they, they wrote on their clay so that they would know what different stuff was and the different locations and all that. So this is some of the um, hands-on body systems that I got from Starla. 
and and this takes about a week because because they want to be precise and um, <clears throat> excuse me again this is some more stuff that we do um, I have them to make a heart and put uh, the stuff at the top of the heart, the arteries and the veins, but until they can actually see what's inside of the heart, they don't get it. So you can see um, this is fun to teach and it, they really start learning when they see what we're talking about. And it's not just me trying to, to draw on the board because that is not very um, exciting. And some of my students from this past year working, um, they, um, want to be precise they always want me every person in my class hey look at this one is this good does this match and i'm like listen as long as it fits in your torso can it's good you don't have to get my permission on everything so like i said i've had to learn how to adapt the dvds for the stand-up ones to this so it's that's been a learning curve for me too um this is one of those hands-on this is the skin and we did the three layers um, you can see the stick pins in there for the sudoferous and sebaceous glands. Um, this was really interesting because the students had no idea of this, what was really going on in the skin and then the hair follicle that's sticking up. And, and they really learned a lot from this one. So um, anytime you have clay, let them do it because you'd be surprised at, at um, how they learn and, and how quickly they're understanding what's going on with the potty. So this is some more of my clay. And host in the classroom is one of our very favorite things. Well, yeah. I Before yes. you get started with hosts of Fridays, um, yes. Tamara had a question. Have you ever tried virtually with students who are at their house without getting clay from you first? Uh, no, um, I'm sure there's all kinds of stuff. I have, I've heard different ideas about using, um, uh, fruit roll-ups and I'm not, when I, I, if I hear somebody talk about it, then I could probably say, yes, do this, but no, I've not had to, to do that yet, but I would tell them, get some spaghetti, get some fruit roll-ups and just make stuff like that. Um, luckily with the clay they they've gotten clay before they've been quarantined but they also um uh my lights just in my classroom just went off i'm gonna get up so i'll they'll come back on they um uh have to take pictures with their phones and at from home distant learning and then email it to me that way so I don't know if that helped. Did that answer your question? I think so. yes. She said okay. it did answer her question. And there's there's just all kinds of stuff that you could use at home. I'm just, like I said right now. I'm just like ah uh, I don't know. So um I I have been lucky that they've gotten their clay and stuff like that before, and I make them carry it in their backpack so they have to have they can have it at home and in class. So, but always have extra because somebody's going to say, I cleaned out my backpack and I left my clay at home. So always have extra for that too. Um, I want to start with HOSA in the classroom. Listen, this is the best thing that you could ever do in your class. Plus you um, need to incorporate HOSA into your lesson plans because this is part of our curriculum. And so every Friday week or Thursday, we call it HOSA day here. And we've gotten our other um, organizations to call it whatever their uh, organization is Friday. And I have, like I said, I have 140 students in my class and not every one of them want to join HOSA as a freshman. And I'm like, okay, you're still going to do work in class and you're still going to do some kind of a HOSA work on Friday. So I'm going to tell you two things and I've got it written down. All students participate in HOSA Friday. They think if they don't join, they don't have to do anything. But I'm like, yes, you're going, you're going to get busy and do stuff. So for non HOSA joining students, I have it up on the board what they're going to do. So they're still logging into HOSA.org. They are going down to healthcare issues exam 
and and on the reference number four I, that's how much i use this number four is a reference and you can click on to cnn uh, msn webmd all different kinds of stuff now you have to pick out five three different it depends on right now we're just writing down reading three health articles and they have to write down five facts now then um before i got smart which was last year i was letting them type this up in their chromebook and emailing it to me and they were copying and pasting it and they think i'm dumb but i would have students go i didn't copy and paste that and they would keep it in the same font and the same color and so their articles and their facts were in the font from whatever their their article was and it was never the same i'm like oh so you change fonts and color all the time and they're like what are you talking about so that's how you know so i make them write everything down in their notebook um also we do some mini researches um papers and i'll show you that in a second over different um health trends that's one of my favorite things to do and this past friday we did it over um medical marijuana and um so they get on their chromebooks each student has a chromebook and they start doing their own search but before they would do that they're like are you sure we're not going to get in trouble um i'm like no they know you're in my class they know that you're researching stuff and so um, they did really well a lot of them were for it and a lot of them were against it and so I haven't had the chance to come back and talk about talk about it why but if you're in hosa and i'll show you how i help them pick out their hosa event after they picked it out every friday they can stay in the classroom or they can go out in the hall they have to get their reference book and their notebook and i make my students write down 20 to 25 facts about their event in their notebook every Friday and I have them to turn to like um, if it's a three ring or a three subject notebook into the back and then they on whatever page it is they have to label that what week it is so that they'll know so when it comes time to take before they take the test um, for the state level then they can go back and just read over their facts real quick and so that that it has proven very well for uh, my students here is a research paper and I've got it on two different sides, but this is this would be one thing. This one, um, Tony did in her class. Um, the topic was vitamin IV drip therapy. And so we have them to write a page and define the topic, the pros and cons of the topic. Is it healthy? Why or why not? And so can you imagine what these freshmen were thinking about over medical marijuana doing all this? And they're like, well, I'm not gonna tell you if I do it. And I'm like, I don't care, just write it down. So. Um, I think it's important that you come up with the topics that the students are interested in, not what you're interested in. And Luann, um, we have about five more minutes left. Okay. Just to give okay. you a heads up. Thank you. I'll go fast. Um, how I get my students to know what career that they are, what competitive event. In HOSA.org, if you'll go to competition, um, you can click on competitive event useful tools and this chart will come up and we're secondary so i make them answer the question and there's eight questions and i always say you're going to say yes are you creative of course you are but do you want to work with a team so they're um, picking out events that seem interested to them and so they can scroll down on this page and it very briefly gives a detail about what each career is about um, last year or this year, we have 61 members in HOSA. From my class alone, I have 20 students that are in health science. So that leaves me a lot of other students that aren't, um, but that's okay. Um, last, last year, five of our, my class uh, participated in the state leadership conference. So that's a cool thing. These are pictures from the last time that we had students that went to internationals. So, um, do you have any questions? This is my email. My email. Um, I would love to send you anything. I would like to, you know, if you have any questions, let me know. You're more than welcome to email me and I would love to send you any of my papers that I do. 
So. Luann, you did a wonderful job. Thank you so, so very, very much. Thank you. So um, the last but not least is our final presenter from Oklahoma. And Tony is also your incoming Health Science Educators Association uh, chair, so president. So we're so excited to have you today, Tony. And um, are you ready? I am ready. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I'll just let you take it away. Okay. Okay, um, I'll try to look at my chat box. It's over here on my other screen. So if I'm not looking at you, that's fine. Um, so my uh, topic is, um, I'm gonna tell you what I do in my classroom. I teach health science um, two, three, and four. Um, I work with Luann, she teaches health science one. So we do, we share a lot of ideas. So some of it's gonna be sound repetitive, but we do it completely different. So, um, I'll show you uh, some of my pictures. Um, this is my husband, Kyle. These are my three kids. This is Brady. She's a freshman at Oklahoma Baptist University. Hey, Tony, we can't see your screen, sweetie. Oh, okay. I think Luann's got to stop sharing so you can take over. Okay. Luann, can you hit the stop share at the top? There you go. Oh my goodness, that's a gorgeous family. Thank you. Thank you. This is my middle daughter, Addie. She's a junior at Durant High School. She's in my classes. Brady is also in my classes. And this is my son, Luke. Um, this is Copper. He's one of my two beagles. My other beagle, Bella, is uh, she does. She's older and so she's grumpier and she doesn't like to have a picture made. So she's not in the picture. She's not in the slideshow. But he's this is my favorite family member right here. So um, that's a little bit about me. So um, this is my 12th year to teach health science education here at Durant High School. We are a comprehensive high school in Oklahoma. I also serve as the school nurse manager. So I'm the RN for the district. And then I have three LP, uh, six LPNs that work at each campus uh, underneath me. Um, before I started teaching, I was a labor and delivery nurse for 16 years. So I think it was Karen that said that the humans that make the tiny humans are horrible. They can be sometimes. The makers of the tiny humans will eat yes. the peds people alive. <laughs> so labor and delivery, yes, it's it's interesting at times. Um, so I have my BSN from the University of Oklahoma. I have my master's in exercise science from Southeastern Oklahoma State University. So I am a uh, exercise nerd, I guess you could say, that's what Luann calls me anyway. So um, that's a little bit about me. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about how I do interactive notebooks, how I do anatomy. I'm gonna talk to you quite a bit about curriculum enhancements. I love the curriculum enhancements because I have ADHD and I can't just stay in my room for 48 minutes and lecture. We have to be doing something. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you about how I do HOSA in the classroom. So the first thing that I'm going to tell you about is our um, interactive notebooks. So the way I lecture, I don't just stand in front of the room and talk. We have kind of like guided note taking. Um, my goal in that is to get them to learn how to take notes. When I graduated high school and went to college, I did not know how to take notes. Um, so I'm trying to get them used to taking notes from what they're hearing. Um, so I guide them in this in health science two. And in health science three, I kind of do a little less. And so I'm trying to get them to where when they graduate, they don't need guided um, note taking templates. They, they know how to take um, important information down. I use um, this human body bundle. It's from Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, it's under Amy Brown Science. It's amazing. Excuse me. It has, I will show you some of the things, but it comes with a teacher's edition. It's updated regularly. Every time she up, updates it, it updates in your file. 
Um, it's really good. I've used this for several years. My kids love it. So this is where you can find, this is what it looks like on Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, and it says warm-ups and bell ringers. There are a lot of warm-ups and bell ringers on there, but I use it for the um, for my note-taking templates. There's also like assessments in there and everything. It's really good. So this is kind of what it looks like. They um, This will be on the board underneath my overhead projector. And as we start, so this was our very first chapter and we're talking about body cavities. So I write down the notes as I lecture and I do this for all three of my health science two classes because if I write this ahead of time, they're just copying down the notes and they're not listening to me. So this is just how I lecture. So I talk, I say, okay, so wh what are our body cavities and why are they important? So then I'll have the students, you know, answer some questions and then we will write down areas of the body that house, you know, body cavities are areas of the body that house a group of internal organs. They offer protection while allowing the organs to expand and contract. And I'm like, okay, which organs would be expanding and contracting? So I add to this, but this is kind of like our template. And so, um, like Susie said about color, I love color. I have colored pens on my desks for them to use, but most of the time um, after they get in my class and they know that we're using these colored pens a lot, they'll have their own like little pen holder with their color or their own colored pens in there. Um, so I use different colors just as I'm writing and then they, they just pick up and do the same thing. Um, so like this is what this would look like at the end of the day. And then I use my iPhone to in the notes, you can scan documents. So I'll take pictures of all of the notes that we did that day and I will email it to myself. And then I put those notes on Infinite Campus, which is our um, online learning system. So if the students are gone, they can pull up Infinite Campus and put these notes in their notebooks. Um, so our notebooks in my class, I use three ring binders and just loose leaf paper um, because we add regular paper uh, templates to that, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. So they don't necessarily have this. They just write the notes down that I'm putting here. Now, sometimes if we are labeling stuff, I'll print these out for them and they just um, tape them to the paper that's on there. But I love these things. So here's, some more examples of them. So this was the human skeleton. Um, this is the intro to the digestive system. This is the one for the intro to the nervous system. And there's anywhere from 10 to 25 of these per chapter. So per digestive system or per um, the nervous system. So there's a lot of information in that Amy Brown science and it comes with a teacher version so it tells you what goes here. And then I add some stuff from our textbook in there as well. And um, this is the textbook I use for Health Science 2. Health Science 2, where we are, um, is Anatomy and Physiology Introduction and Medical Terminology. So this, I really love this book. This book also has a lot of kind of like a workbook um, built into it at the end of each chapter. There's a lot of questions in there. Um, so these are some examples of the diagrams that come with this book. So I will print these off. Um, so the digital version, the, like the teacher's digital version, you can print these off. And I will hand these out to the students and then we'll you know, label the um, regions and then the quadrants and they will put that in their notebook for that chapter. And um, this skeletal, um, paper also comes with that book. So I will print this out for them. And this um, will be blank and we will fill this in underneath my overhead projector, which um, shows up on my board and we'll fill this in. And like you can see, I love color. So they've colored in, you know, this different bones so they can tell the difference in them. And then um, at the end of each day, we do reflections. So these two pictures on the middle and the right are um, examples of our reflection. So the last 10 minutes of the day, um, I will stop my, my lecturing 
and they will do their reflection. So this is kind of like um, Susie's doodle notes that she was talking about, and I encourage them to use color. So every day they will have a reflection page. So they will have to write down or draw pictures or rewrite the notes if they're not good drawers, which I would not be. But I uh, tell them, you know, you can use the book. There's diagrams in the book. You can trace those and then color them in. So this reflection, I have them put the date and then reflection. So this date we did kind of like a concept map of the skeletal system. And then she um, defined ossification right here. And then we had some word parts that we talked about. So while we're lecturing, they can keep their reflection page out or they can write down, you know, because on this day I was telling them, you know, osteo is the word part for bone and site is cell. So she wrote that down in her notes and then added that onto her reflection. So this is also what I use as like my exit, exit ticket for the day because I walk around and I see what they're putting on their reflection. So I can tell if they were listening, if they have any questions, they'll ask me as I'm walking around. And so I kind of can tell if they're catching on to what we're talking about or if not. And so this one on the right, you know, she drew her quadrants up here and then she has her body cavities here and I encourage them to use color. I love the coloring. So that's our reflections. The kids hate the reflections the first few days because they don't know what to put on there. Um, so I show them some examples of some classes that, you know, in the past, what they put on their reflections, and then they catch on really quick and they just start making it their own. And it's, it's really cool to see how the reflections progress from day one to the end of the year. So this is what I use for my exit ticket. Um, they love the organization of the notebooks. They also love paper and pencil. So um, they're called interactive and a lot of people think that that means um, it has to be digital. Mine is not digital whatsoever. We put everything in that three ring binder on paper that they write out. Um, they have page dividers for each chapter. So, you know, once we finish the skeletal system, they'll put a page divider and then we will start the muscular system. So at the end of the, the chapter, we will have a test and on these tests, they can use their notebook. So if they've taken good notes, if they have, you know, their reflections done, and actually most of the kids say that they get most of the information that they need to answer the test questions from their reflection pages. And so that tells me that they are getting the content because on the reflection page, pages, it should be their own words. It shouldn't be word for word what I what we wrote down in our lecture as their notes. I want them to rewrite it in their own words. So I know that they're getting it. And so that's why I let them use their notes on it. And then after that chapter, they'll grade their own notebook. And as I'm walking around, I know who does their reflections and who does not do their reflections. So I let them grade it themselves, but if, you know, I know this student is not doing their reflections every day and they give themselves a hundred, I go back in and change it to a zero. I'm like, you're either honest or you get a zero. There's no in between. So they will take off if they don't have all of their notes. So say they were gone one day and they didn't get the notes off of Infinite Campus. And so they take off points for that. Um, their reflections must be a full page for each day. If their reflection's not a full page, um, they take off. Um, we also do a word part worksheet. So they will have to write down the word parts and define them and they do that in their notebook as well. Um, do you let them use their guided notes or reflection notes on the test? I let them use their whole notebook. So anything that's in that notebook, they can use on their test. Now we do have some tests that I don't let them use notes on. So it just kind of depends on what the, the chapter notes, they can use their interactive notebooks. Our anatomy tests, which I'll go over in just a second, they have to study those. But So the kids actually love the organization and the structure of these interactive notebooks. So one of the um, hands-on things that we do, like Luann said, is we use our anatomy and clay. We've written several grants to build up our supply. In my class, we use the standard mannequins. Um, each student gets a half, and so we do an adoption day like she does. They put their name on these little yellow sticky notes, 
Um, this day they were doing their assessment of the bones. So we will go over the skeletal system and I have a list of bones that they have to label. So for example, on my board, it said number one is frontal. So they have to find the frontal bone and with their pencil, they will put a number one on the frontal bone and then we will grade them in class. Um, these, they cannot use their notes. So I feel like I let them use their notes on the chapter test, but on the anatomy test, they have to study it. So I think that's kind of a good balance that I have there. Um, okay, so um, about our anatomy and clay, with mine that's different than Luann's, we build each system on here and I use this DVD. So um, if you guys are on the um, Health Science Education Association Facebook page, which if you're not, you should be, but I'll talk about that later. But um, someone asked the other day, you know, how do you know what muscles to build? Because there's no way I could build all the muscles. And yes, that's true. I only build the nine muscles that are on this video. And they said, well, we didn't get the video with ours. And I said, well, we did, but we've had it a while. So I encourage you, if you don't have this video that came with ours, it might not have come with yours to call them and say, hey, I purchased a lot of uh, skeletons. And so I feel like I should get this DVD. So it kind of walks them through it. I play it on my board in my classroom. As it's playing, we're building because it teaches them step-by-step -step how to do it. So we'll leave, um, we'll build the muscular system. We'll leave that on there. And then when we go to the cardiovascular system, we'll add that on there. And so by the end of the year, they've got every body system on there except integumentary. And so then we'll take it all apart at the end and clean them with the uh, magic erasers and they're good to go for the next year. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna talk about are the curriculum enhancements. I use curriculum enhancements quite a bit because I like, like I said, I have some ADHD. I like to be doing things. I feel like I learn better when I'm doing hands-on things. So um, I think my students do too. I don't know if they do, but they act like it, they do. So this one is a chalk line activity that's under the body organization uh, part of the curriculum enhancements um, from Nishi. And I think um, someone put in the chat earlier how much it costs. They are a little costly, but they are so good and it's definitely worth it. There's, um, I'm gonna show you the activities that I use, but there's also assessments, um, charts, lots of different things that you can use. I'm just gonna show you the few a few of the ones that I use. So this is the one that we do at the very beginning of the year. Um, on this, we go outside to different areas. We um, will take our sidewalk chalk and I will partner them up. And one uh, partner will lay down on the ground while the other one traces um, him or her. And then we'll do a front side and a back side. So both partners lay down on the ground and get traced. So we'll have an anterior side and a posterior side per team. And then they will label, um, there's different things on there that they have to label. I think there may be close to 30 things that they have to label that's on the um, activity that's in the enhancement. So they have to label distal, um, proximal, the quadrants, the different cavities. Um, so my kids absolutely love this. Um, it looks kind of like a crime scene outside because I'll take my three classes to different areas. We do the front porch. We do the bus loop and then we do the back side of the sidewalk um, coming into the back of the building. So there's bodies everywhere on the sidewalk um, for a couple of weeks until it fades off. But the kids love it. Um, so this is a uh, an, an, uh, lab that we do with the integumentary system. So we don't build the integumentary system on our mannequins. So this is one of the ones that I love to do. Um, because we're not doing that hands-on, I feel like we need some hands-on. So we will do this Snickers lab, and I don't have any pictures for you because we haven't done it yet this year, but um, we'll each get a, a mini Snickers, and we will remove the chalk, you know, we will answer these questions that are on this Snickers lab, and then we will um, correlate it to the layers of the skin. So this is a really cool one. I can't wait to do this and it's gonna work out perfectly because it's gonna be around Halloween so I can get the mini Snickers. And so my kids love it. 
um, they put on gloves while they do it. So then, and then I put down some uh, wax paper so that they can eat their Snickers when we're done with it. So, um, is there a good substitute for peanut restricted schools? So we did talk about this um, the other day, Luam and I were talking about it and we, there are a couple of candy bars that have somewhat of the different layers. They're not gonna have, it's not gonna be as good as the Snickers because it's not gonna have the peanuts and the different things. But yes, a Twix is one of the ones that we talked about doing for the peanut allergy um, students. So yes, that's a good that's a good question. So my kids love this one. Um, the next one, the cardiovascular system, we play two games um, with this. Um, the first one is a blood flow game. So this one can actually either be, it's in a PowerPoint or a Google slide. So you could put it, you can make a copy and put it on their online learning and they drag and drop the arrows into this um, heart. When I do it in class, I put it up on the board and they just take turns coming up to the board and dragging and dropping the arrows for the direction of the blood flow. They love that one. Um, this one, the um, who am I? This one, I put this, this template up on my board and I have um, colored uh, index cards with the answers on them and they are sitting on a table in front of my board and we'll go around the room and a student will come up and pick whichever answer he, whichever answer he has, he will find, he or she will find the correct answer and then attach it, just tape it. I have tape on the back of the cards and we'll just stick it on the square where it belongs. So we do that um, for our circulatory system. That one's a good one. They love this one. Um, the respiratory system, I actually have not used this one yet. I plan on using this one. One of the good things that I love about the curriculum enhancements is usually they give you a with technology and without technology option so that you can, you know, I usually use the without technology because it, I do it hands on in class. But if you have a virtual learner or, you know, your whole class, your whole school is virtual, you can do the technology one. So this one, you're going to like fold it up and you're going to have different uh, labels here. Um, and you're going to have one side that's like a normal lung and one side that's uh, diseased or um, a certain condition type of lung. So the two sides are not going to be the same. Um, so it says here, have one side represent a normal lung and the other side illustrate a lung disease. So this one's really cool. I can't wait to use this one. Um, this is one of the favorites that we do. Uh, our nervous system, we make a balloon brain. And there's different um, variations of this. I've seen people use shower caps and they write on the shower caps. Um, my kids love the balloons. So I just buy a huge bulk size of white balloons. And um, this activity on um, the enhancements will tell you what to do. So. Um, you have to draw and label the four lobes of the brain, draw and label other structures of the brain like the cerebellum, the medulla oblongata, and then label on the brain where the following functions are controlled. So attention, breathing, decision making, emotion, and they draw pictures, you know, of like emotions. So like temperature, this one had a temperature gauge. And so they love taking their balloons to the other classes. And the teachers love seeing them and their brains and how different they are throughout the day. So this is one of my students' absolute uh, favorites. Um, medical terminology. So we all know medical terminology can be super boring if all you do is write down the terms and uh, define them. So I actually stole this medical terminology idea from the um, Facebook page, the HSEA Facebook page. And so I had a sweet um, old lady donate um, all eight seasons of House to me on DVD. And so once per chapter, 
we will find a house episode that correlates with whatever we're talking about, the skeletal system, the muscular system. And I actually, you can go on Google and Google list of diagnoses from house, the TV series, and it will tell you the season, the episode number and what the main diagnosis in that show was. My kids absolutely love it. Um, I have, the, I put in some uh, writing components in with it. So they have to find seven, and I don't know where I came up with the number seven. They use seven, they have to uh, find seven uh, medical terms that were used in that episode and they will write them down as we're watching and then they will define them and then they have to use them in a sentence, okay? So say, you know, um, they heard the word cardiomegaly. So they're gonna write that down, they're gonna define it and then they're gonna use that in a sentence. So this actually tells you, this website tells you what you know the diagnoses were. And then I've gone out beside here and just put like, you know, muscular, integumentary, cardiovascular out beside here. So I can just look real quick and find that episode and we show that. Usually I do that on a day when there's like, you know, a a lot of sports are going on that day and a lot of people are gone and I don't want to have to, you know, have a lot of people um, miss uh, a lot of lecture. Uh, yeah, the brain balloon, all of those things for from the enhancements, the curriculum enhancements. Okay, so um, all of my, all of my, um, both of my classes, Health Science 2 and Health Science 3, we use precision exams. Um, my Health Science 3, which are my health professions class, they um, take the medical assistant clinical lab procedures and the CNA, and then what other, whatever exam correlates with their HOSA event. So if they are doing clinical nursing, I'll have them take some of the other medical assistant ones. Um, if they're doing nutrition, there's a nutrition one. Our school buys the um, school bundle so that we have unlimited exams. Um, so um, I give it to all of my kids. My health science two students, which is the A&P and med term class, they take the health science fundamentals. Um, these exams are really good. Um, our, in our area where we live, a lot of all of our employers and the employers in like the Oklahoma City area take these exams as their certification. So um, it's a lot cheaper than say some, some of the other exam uh, certification places that we've used in the past. So I really like precision exams. I give them a pretest um, at the beginning of the year and then I give them the post test at the end of the year. Um, my health science three class, which is my health professions class, um, they do clinical rotations at various health offices around our community to get their clinical hours in. I try to expose them to as many um, health, different health professions because I want them to see what all is out there. So they will do clinicals um, two hours a day on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, I have them as a block class. So I have a longer time frame with them. Um, we have a family medicine physician, we have a dentist, we have a pediatrician, and we have a vet in these pictures, but they go to about 13 different places. They just rotate through throughout the year. Um, the curriculum that I use for my health science three or my health professions class, we use the DHO um, textbook from Cengage. And then I love Health Center 21. So I use this for my health science three and my health science four capstone class. Um, there I have built my own uh, modules. So I kind of included some nursing and some medical assisting in there so that they can take both of those certifications. Um, this is very good. Um, like last year we had to end or year before last, we had to end the year um, distance learning after spring break. So they were still able to do a lot of their stuff or all of their stuff on Health Center 21. So I really like that. And if they miss a day, they can watch the videos, you know, the instructional videos on that and they don't have to listen to me. Um, okay, and then HOSA Friday. Um, like Luann said, every Friday is HOSA Friday at DHS. So our students pick their competitive event within the first two weeks of school. The first, we usually start on a Thursday. That second day of school, we're talking about HOSA. 
we're showing them different um, videos from past um, uh, HOSA conferences. Um, we always show the Ben Carson video from when he spoke at HOSA conference several years ago because, I mean, Ben, Cos ben Carson's awesome, but it's also at HOSA conference, so it's really good. Um, they study on their uh, HOSA event every Friday. So from like at least the beginning of September until we test the last week in February, they're working on their HOSA event, event every Friday. Um, students who don't join HOSA that are in our classes do HOSA related activities. Um, and I'll show you some of those in just a second. So this year we have 61. We usually take around 15 students that qualify for ILC each year. So we have a pretty decent sized um, HOSA program for our state. Um, and we are a comprehensive high school. So um, sometimes those don't have as others. Um, so here are some pictures of the last actual ILC that we got to attend um, since the last two have been virtual. We're keeping our fingers crossed that we get to attend in person um, this year. These are my two girls. So um, both of my girls don't have the choice. They have to be in HOSA, but they actually do like it. So this was the group that we took two years ago, or yeah, the last two years. Um, so our HOSA students will tab their resource, resource book. As soon as they know what event they're doing, they'll pull up their guidelines and there'll be a test plan on those guidelines that tells you like, you know, uh, injuries to tissues are like 15% of the test. So they're gonna find that they're gonna get their resource book. Um, and then I, I buy those books with my career tech um, uh, money. And they'll, I just keep them in my classroom because they study most of the time here. So they'll tab the books, you know, like the chapters that they need to study. And they'll take notes in their notebooks in that interactive notebook. They'll have a section just for their host of stuff. So they'll take notes as they're going through. And then every other Friday, I have them um, change it up. They'll do a Quizlet sometimes to kind of just check themselves to see how they're progressing. And then the next Friday, they'll go back to studying in their book. Um, so they can also take precision exams as pre-test and post-test as we progress throughout the year to see how they're doing as well. Um, our non-HOSA students, they'll do various career activities. Most of them I get from the HOSA website. So some examples I'm gonna show you. So we do this, um, uh, health science graphic organizer for technical articles. So I'll have them go to the healthcare issues exam and pull up the websites that have the health articles. And then they'll fill in this box um, over a health article. So like last Friday, we were on the muscular system. So I had them find an article about a muscular injury or disease or disorder. And then so they had to write that over that. Um, we also have goal setting that we do every year, and I make everybody do this, not just my non host of people, but I have them say, okay, what are three goals that you want to do this year? And then for each goal, you need to have one that's easy to attain, you need to have one that's a little bit harder to attain, attain, obtain, and then one that's like super hard. You're going to have to work real hard to obtain that one. And so they put that in the front of their notebook so they can look at those goals um, that they set for themselves over the year. And then like Luann showed, we have our host of Friday research topic sometimes. So the jeweling and vaping one is one that we've done in the past. And they'll just write a one page paper, put it in their notebook, and then I'll come by and check it off. Um, so they're doing, they're defining it, pros and cons of it. Is it healthy? Is it beneficial? Is, is, it, is it as good as everybody says? And would you do it? Why or why not? And then here are some... Um, one of the things about HOSA ILC that I love is there's lots of other um, opportunities for the kids to learn some stuff other than just their competitive event, which is great as well. But one of the things is um, Nishi always has the precision exam certification lab. So um, I, I make all of my kids 
pick at least um, three tests that they have to take on precision exams while they're there because they're free. And so I make them. And so here are some examples of um, students that passed certifications at ILC course the last time that we got to go in person. Um, here are a couple of my health career displays. This team right here was a middle school division. They got third place at ILC, so proud of them. Um, these girls got ninth place at ILC, super proud of them. These were in our um, secondary division. Um, some other things that they love to do, obviously, they love to go to Starless classes. And if you've ever been to ILC, Starless classes fill up super fast. So you better be sitting by that door waiting to get in when the class starts because they love it. So I make them go to um, an educational symposium every hour that they're not competing. So we don't have our free time is when everybody has free time. When everybody's done competing at the end of the day, we go do free time because there's so many things that they can do at ILC. This is a picture of my son playing um, the operation game. And um, this was a pharmacy um, lab where they were compounding and making chapstick. So there's lots of different things for them to do at HOSA ILC. Okay, so a few uh, tidbits that I want to leave you with. This is my email address. If you want to email me any questions, and I'll go over the chat in just a second and make sure there's not any questions that I can answer um, before I get off here. But you should join um, HSEA. Like Laura said, I'm the president elect. Um, so I think I take over in October at the Nishi conference. Um, but there is a Google Drive that HSEA has. And once you pay your $45, you get access to that Google Drive. There is a lot of great information in that Google Drive as well. Um, there is also an HSEA Facebook page. Um, when you go on there, there's going to be some questions that you have to answer, like, are you a health science teacher? Because we don't want students getting on there and, you know, stealing our answers to, you know, if we have an activity and there's something that has answers. So we ask you if you're a teacher and are you currently teaching and are you going to try to sell us stuff because we don't want that out there. And then do you agree to the rules? So if you don't answer all of those questions, it kicks you out. So make sure that you're answering those, um, those uh, criteria questions at the beginning. And then last, if you have the opportunity to go to an Ishi conference, they are the best professional development conferences I've ever been to. So I've been to maybe mm, three so far. And I learn so much stuff every time. So I would highly encourage you if you're not going to Cincinnati, um, the end of October, that would be well worth your time. Um, Luann and I are presenting at Cincinnati as well. So if you wanna come see us in person and make fun of our Oklahoma accents, come on, it will be awesome. It'll be a good time. Um, you can also, uh, usually precision exams is there. You can look at those um, exams um, to see if that's something that you want to do. Uh, you can also look at, there's lots of other vendors that are there. It's a very, very good conference. Um, if you need help um, convincing your school to go, you can go onto the Nishi website and there is a um, letter that you can kind of Form, it's a form letter that you can kind of use to turn into your administration to see if they will pay for that. So let me go to the chat. Um, um, yeah, is there any way around putting on my profile that I'm a teacher so I can still join the Facebook group? Yeah, there is. I mean, as long as you're a teacher, I mean, it, it, other stuff in your bio is probably going to tell us that anyway. So, um, yes, the one in Denver was great. Um, yes, the pre-conference. There's also pre-conference workshops. And I really, really like the pre-conference workshops. Um, I've been to, we went to the Anatomy and Clay one at the pre-conference in Denver. And then we went to the pre-conference year before last in St. Louis. I can't remember what it was, but it was good. Um, so yes, the pre-conferences are also very good. Um, yes, Katrina and Rhonda will be doing um, a pre-conference over the enhancements that I'm actually uh, signed up to attend that one. So I'm, I'm, I'm anxious for that one. 
and let's see. Will it be completely different if we attend online? I don't know because I've never attended one online, but I can tell you we have a lot of fun. Yes, um, I can answer that question. Okay. Yes, it will be. Um, there's just a few sessions uh, that are going to be, I mean, obviously, we can't record every session. And so I don't know, I'm not positive that they'll be live. We are going to record the general speakers and then probably whoever else is put in that particular room. But um, that's all. It's not going to be every session. So yeah, that's why coming in person really is so much better. But if you can't do that, then um, then signing up online is a good thing. Yeah, plus you can you can we we can get together and like talk and in person is great, but I know not everybody can do it in person. Somebody asked, do you ever do any live events in a Facebook group? I don't think that we have, but that is a great idea. I mean, I guess some of us could just go like um, announce that we're going to go Facebook live, especially when we're doing some of these hands on activities. That's a great idea. So um, I might do that when we I think we do integumentary next and we're going to do our Snickers lab. So um, I may give you guys some warning when we're going to do that and I'll go Facebook live on our um, Facebook page when we're doing that Snickers lab and see how that goes. That's a great idea. I like that. And also, um, you might consider uh, tuning in for Wednesday webinars if you haven't before. We have webinars about every two weeks, and they're scheduled through the end of this end of, end of this semester. So you can see and plan. There's also going to be um, this uh, exact this session is being recorded, and it will also be posted um, on our website. That's healthscienceconsortium.org. Um, uh, one last thing: the as far as the Wednesday webinars, they've all been archived. So there is some fantastic information. If you haven't, if you're interested in the enhancements, perhaps there was um, one session done by the creators last year. And then just last week, um, another um, individual did, is who's a classroom teacher, shared how she uses them. So you can just go back out there again, healthscienceconsortium.org and um, see what see what all's out there. Thank you, Amanda. Amanda put the link to the Health Science Consortium page and then with the that takes you directly to the webinars. Thank you, Amanda. Does anybody have any questions for me? I know I'm a fast talker, so I'm sorry. I didn't think you, you and Lou Ann could talk fast. I thought people, you know, that if you have a, an, out, uh, an accent, you weren't supposed to be a fast talker, but you did great, Tony. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. And I can't tell you guys how excited I've been to see this many people engaged on a Saturday afternoon. Um, so thank you so much for your time. And um, we're gonna go ahead and sign off, but thank you again. Thank you guys. Um, Maria, I see your question about the PD, and yes, if you email the um, Nishi email address, I don't have it with me right now, but if you email, then they can get you the PD for today. All you need to do is do nancy at healthscienceconsortium.org. Nancy at. Is that the email that's on the Zoom? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, tell me, are you still here? Yes. Um, I had a question about how do you have students pick 
in the first two weeks, what events they want to do at HOSA. Um, my students come in their 11th grade year, and that's the first year they're exposed to HOSA at all. And so I have, I, I have had them for five weeks now, and they still haven't really picked. So any suggestions you have on that? Um, well, I pull up on the HOSA website, there is a kind of like a crosswalk that asks like what they're interested in and stuff like that. And then that first Friday that I'm talking to them um, about HOSA, we'll pull up the guidelines on my smart board and just go over each one. Okay, so this, I kind of give them a brief little snippet about what it, you know, if, if it has a test or if it has a skill or if it's a uh group project or a partner project, stuff like that. So we kind of go over that. And some of them take a little bit longer than the first two weeks. But um, especially my health science three kids, I had them the year before in health science two, they know pretty quick what they want to do. Those health science two kids that have come from Lou Ann's class, they know what they want to do or at least change it up. Um, the other kids I'm walking, I'm helping them just explain to them what they're interested in. And, you know, sometimes they study it for two, you know, a month or two and then decide that they don't want to do that. So I let them switch, you know, because I want it to be something that they're interested in or they're not going to study. So that's just kind of what I do. Do you guys have, is the, is the state conference the first time that you guys are competing or is there anything in your state before that? No, there's nothing in our state before that. So they just will, we'll take the first round test, you know, the first week of, or the last week of February is when ours is. And so there's nothing before that. Okay, awesome. Thank you. No problem. Okay, I'm gonna stop the record now. Okay, thank you. I, I wouldn't let me do it. I don't know why. Does Nancy have to stop?